All right, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the Winnetka Village Council study session for July 12, 2022. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask that you uh, either mute or turn off your uh, cell phones or electronic devices so we can have a good uninterrupted conversation this evening. Uh, before I get started on the, on the agenda, I just wanted to say that uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, meet with, with uh, many, many people after the uh, events in Highland Park on July 4th. And uh, there's been a real concern, frustration, uh, confusion as to what roles the village could possibly play with respect to uh, gun issues in general. And some people have some very specific ideas. And, uh, you know, there's a real frustration here, at least for, for particularly for me, that, uh, you know, all, those of us who track these things and understand how laws are made and how they're enforced and which ones are more a statement of community conscience than they are an actual enforcement action. And, you know, the frustrating thing about anything to do with firearms is that it falls into that category. Uh, you know, we haven't visited as a, as a village council. The last time I remember having any conversation about firearms was back in uh, 2008 when uh, uh, the courts ruled that our handgun ban at that point in time was, I believe they, they ruled that it was not sustainable and we had to actually vote to remove that from our ordinance. Uh, and that's the last time I think there's been any substantive conversations here in council chambers about that subject. Uh, but that said, I mean, people have approached me and they need to talk. And I think as a village council, we need to listen and we need to talk and really understand where we are in this situation because we haven't visited for 14 years now and try to have a, gain a better understanding of, of what it is we have on the books, uh, what is it, if anything, that we wish to do, and how do we accomplish that through what we can do here at Village Council. Uh, I also attended the meeting via Zoom last night with the uh, Moms Demand Action Group, and I have to say that uh, it was a very com compelling and thoughtful conversation that really helped me hone in on, on what things uh, we possibly can talk about, think about, and use as a platform to begin the conversations. So I'm going to ask all the trustees that uh, we try to find an evening sometime in August because kicking this can down the road isn't what the public wants from us. So I think it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and, and at least address the issue firsthand and do it in a timely manner uh, and see what we can come up with, if anything. But I, I think, I know as, as, as village president, I really feel a strong uh, obligation to the community to have these conversations and see what people in town really think about this. So uh, Rob will be reaching out to all of you to figure out if we have a day on the calendar that, that it all can work, but we'll schedule a special study session. Uh, to talk about that matter and that matter only. So, and I encourage everybody here in the room and those of you who might be watching this uh, on tape afterwards, uh, this is a meeting I hope you attend and, and participate in so we can get a really good sense of, of the community consciousness on, on this particular issue. So, that's that. All right, moving forward, uh, welcome plan commissioners. Mr. John Golan will be serving as the acting chairperson of the Plan Commission this evening, a long-standing member of the Plan Commission. And uh, before we get going, I need to ask uh, Rob to do a roll call for attendance. Trustee Dahlman. Present. Trustee Swart. Here. Trustee Dearborn. Here. Trustee Mancini. Here. President Rince. Present. All right. And secondly, we're going through all sorts of uh, procedure this evening. I have to ask David to do a roll call for the attendance of the plan commission. Um, Acting Chair Golan. Present. Uh, Member Case. Present. Member Danley. Present. Member Kunkel. Present. Uh, quorum of the plan commission is present. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, the next item, item on the uh, agenda is public comment. Uh, this is the time of the evening where anybody who wishes to address Village Council on any item that is not on the agenda, they're welcome to come up to the podium. Uh, while we don't regularly in enforce a strict three limit policy, we have a lot of work to do tonight, a lot of work to do. And we've got a huge document that we've got to plow through and I turn into a pumpkin at 9.30. So with that said, I, I'm, I'm asking those who approach the podium to address us this evening that you're responsibly brief and you're cognizant of the time that you're at the podium and if it starts to go a little long, I'm sorry, I might have to remind you to move it along. So uh, with that, I'll open up the microphone to anybody who wishes to speak. You better hurry up or I'm gonna close public comment and that'll be it for the evening, folks. <laughs> I'll read this. I timed it and it was two minutes and 45 seconds. So but I'm going to try and slow down so that people can understand it. So let me start with an issue. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you all for letting me speak because uh, I know you have a lot to do tonight and I really understand how important the comprehensive plan is and how hard you've worked. The issue is that I'm here to talk about a Trojan horse and that is plant foliage privacy screens and barriers on unprecedented planter boxes. I've, I've given you some, some visuals to look at in terms of uh, these planter boxes. The first one has a plan view and also an elevation view that shows that they extend outward from the toe of the um, bluff and therefore extend the land mass out into Lake Michigan. What I'm asking you to do tonight is Please do not sign a letter of support for rejuvenation of the Elder Centennial Parks that involves this planter box Trojan horse. That will allow future multiple privacy screens and barriers to adjacent public beach land in Winnetka. In other words, if, if, this, if IDNR allows this to occur, then others can do this in addition to the park district. This isn't just a park district issue. So the background, um, the new plan for Elder Centennial Park still has the same planter boxes as the plan rejected by some 1,500 Winnetkans. Just like the multiple five foot high boulder breakwaters walls that now obstruct views and access along uh, Winnetka beaches, once these planter pockets are approved by IDNR, they will set a precedent that will allow other planting pockets along Winnetka beaches that can be employed to grow plants that obstruct views and prevent access to adjacent public beaches. A June 21, 22 drawing allegedly from the co-applicant's design team of, des of his desired plantings for the park planter boxes describe his future intention to fill them with 30 and 40 and 50 foot high trees. If you look at the plants that are there uh, that's not in your drawing, um, and to block views, and then thorny rose bushes to block access. And if you've ever been to Cape Cod and you've ever seen these rose hip bushes, you know how difficult they are to get through. So basically, if you have a lower story of rose hip bushes, you can't get through them. So they basically are a fence. They, they don't look like a fence, they're natural, but they in fact are a fence. While the park district will, can, and proposes to control its plantings, they cannot control the plantings on future planter pockets on adjacent private properties. Now there's an additional issue with planter boxes. Filling in of Lake Michigan planter pockets with the express purpose of creating land in the lake for planting land-based plants. Now what I ask you to do is please avoid employing or implying agreement with filling in of a federal waterway. I think you all know how dangerous this is to get involved with the Army Corps of Engineers on filling in federal waterways. Background, such infilling can be seen as increasing a hundred year storm damage to others on Lake Michigan. Thank you very much and I appreciate your willing to listen to me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Thank you. Three minutes and 37 seconds, not too bad. <laughs> uh, 
I was going to give you five, Chuck. So, <laughs> next, please. you know, the future plan. Hi, Ted Winichenko. Um, so I had uh, two things that I wanted to discuss. I'll just briefly mention both here. Following up on what Mr. Downing said, you know, um, I am disappointed that the plan doesn't address the lake shore. So the lake shore traditionally, historically, was a big sandy beach where people could walk. And over the last, I would say, 15, 20 years, that has become uh, not a thing because multiple private owners have built things out onto the lake. You know, the village seemed, I'm, you know, I'm not a very politically correct kind of guy. I guess that's my problem. But, you know, the village seemed more than happy to go after the guy that put up wood on the easement on Cherry Street to make a planning box. But it seems to me that the village is taking, turning a blind eye to what's going on in the lake. The village has uh, effectively closed multiple public access points to the lake, shut them down, has not maintained them. The village um, doesn't routinely enforce the IDNR requirements that beach access be maintained after um, these structures are built. And I, you know, the cynic community wonders why. Why is that? I guess there's a difference between someone living on Cherry Street and someone living on the lake shore. And I find that disappointing. The beach is there not just for Winnetkins, and that's another thing that bothers me. It's not 1,500 Winnetkins. The beach is held in trust for all the citizens of the state of Illinois. You know, the fact that the park district charges more for non resident I mean, all these things are issues. But it disappoints me that the village is unwilling and is unwilling to put in its plan the idea that we need to return the beach to the way it was historically. That seems like a no-brainer. The village should inf make these owners enforce, enforce access so people can walk in the uh, land that's held in trust. The village should re, um, create, you know, re, uh, inju rejuvenate its access points and it should all be tied together. So I know that's 24 and 2040 plan and also what Chuck said. The other thing I wanted to say is, since I'm here very quickly, I didn't think about this because I didn't realize the 2040 plan would include this. I noticed the idea of a six foot, foot five high, six and a half foot fence to increase privacy for people. You know, the other code change that I would ask is that we uh, allow, like, like we have a front porch. It would be nice to have temporary screens there in the summer. It would let be, it would be more useful. It wouldn't be private, it would be public. It really doesn't really affect the bulk of the house. It, uh, decreases the amount of pesticides that need to be used because we have a screened area which mosquitoes can't get to. And I find the fact that uh, temporary screens are considered a permanent wall by the zoning code uh, disappointing because it really decreases that usefulness. And I'm not even asking for more private space. I'm just asking for a place out on the road where we can sit and enjoy the evening more comfortably. So I would ask that that be added to the 2040. Thanks, Ted. You see, you learn something new every time we come to council. I never knew that we prohibited front screen porches. No, I don't need you to come back. I'm just saying. It's how that area is counted in the gross floor calculation. Ah. You can have it, but then you can't have changes Yeah. And by the way, just so that everybody has clarity here in the room, the village, the village does not have enforcement authority outside of its corporate limits. So, uh, and, our, uh, and our corporate limits end at the water's edge. Uh, next, please. Oh, were you on your way up? I'm sorry. Okay. Come on up, Colleen. No, no. <laughs> First of all, hello. My name's Colleen Root. I live at 326 Woodland Avenue in here in Winneka. I'm here tonight not as a park commissioner. I am here as a private citizen, and I just love your village mission statement. Winneka, the beautiful land, is a treasured North Shore lakefront village. I want to thank you so much for sending letters, withdrawing your support for the Beach in the Box. But I ditto everything that Professor Dowding said and that Ted has said. We're not done with this. The planter pocket is still alive and well. It is a very effective privacy screen. You will hear 
I think, from the president of the park board, but we're not going to plan anything in it. Well, it sets a precedent. The park district may not plan anything, but a private citizen may move forward and seek a permit and do just that. And so I'm asking that you not endorse the current new plan that's really the old plan that strands 50 feet of our southern border of beach at Centennial that still has 261 Sheridan and that endorses moving full speed ahead on two southern breakwater, both the northern breakwater and the southern breakwater. What's interesting is Village Code section 1704 defines Lake Michigan as a public street. I was kind of amazed when I found that. And so your municipality, you must have certain police powers and certain powers to look at ordinances. And I've, I've actually, my husband drafted it. It's crude, it's rude, but it's a rough ordinance for you to consider to stop any blocking of Lakeshore Vista. Now, why am I asking you to intercede? I'm asking you because a concerned citizen, Irene Smith, issued a FOIA request to the Park District. What that FOIA request produced was some pretty interesting communications between the executive director of the Park District and Mr. Justin Ishbia, who owns the property immediately to the south of Centennial. I'm gonna quickly quote just one. It was done March 12, 2022. Note from Justin Ishbia to Jay to John Peterson. Just got this info a few minutes ago. Good news, feel free to share with Warren. I presume that's Warren James. Justin, this is quotes, wanted to follow up with you. My team is reaching back out to the park with a request for additional information related to the louvered walls and beach specifics. Once we have all this information to make a decision, we have 120 days to make a determination. However, we have priori prioritized this project, so it shouldn't take that long. We have asked that the community put information out on their website. Having the community make comment in favor of a project is always beneficial. I don't have any concerns at all about the permit after talking to my team yesterday. They are doing their due diligence to make sure we follow the process and have a record before granting the permit. This was sent before any public notice was issued on the applications for permit that the park district withdrew. It shows a governmental agency that is operating under undue influence. And if they won't protect our shoreline, and if the park district is dead set upon moving forward with a plan that will totally destroy Lakeshore Vista, the precedent that is set, then who's going to do that? Who's going to protect our village? And again, mission statement. Beautiful land, treasured North Shore Lakefront Village. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks. Next up, please. Hi, my name is Judy Rao. We live at 209 Fuller Lane. Thank you very much for letting me come once again. I did time it, it was four minutes, but I think at least a minute and a half it has already been taken by my colleagues, so I will skip over those parts, okay? <laughs> um, as you know, Jim and I are fairly new to the area, and we really enjoyed getting to meet people who are concerned citizens and learning more about how the village governs. One of my many takeaways is that civic pride is high, as is community engagement, and I've also been intrigued learning about the four civic boards, who in theory are to stay in their own lanes, and I realize we're pushing, I'm not pushing you, I'm just questioning you because you're my bright light in this one. Um, the questions I have are, what happens if one of the boards is ignoring their mission? What happens when one of the boards is not staying in their lane or indeed has embarked on a totally different route altogether? And one hap what happens if one of the boards is in fact doing harm? Let's start with the basics. The mission of the Park District is to provide a, a balance of quality recreation and leisure opportunities while protecting assets, natural resources, and open space to benefit present and future generations. It's my opinion that the Park District is not abiding by its own charter. The land swap and the design for the combined parks 
does not protect assets, natural resources, and open space. Rather, those elements are being compromised. To start, they propose to swap what is prime green space, and we net more asphalt on the park table. Yes, the deal also nets us a lovely combined beach, but it will no longer remain open, nor will there be unencumbered views if the, district next, if the park district's next plan goes through, staying in their own lane. Here, too, it's my opinion, the park district has lost its way. It has taken an unethical, um, it has taken an unethical detour. They are following the roadmap, known as the Master Agreement Draft, laid out by Archer 2020 Trust, heeding Ishbaya's request at every turn, full well knowing that they fly in the face of what Winnetka residents want. If you haven't read it, I suggest you look up both the Master Don't Agreement Draft and the FOIA documents that have been alluded to. They are filled with red flags. One noteworthy comment made by Ishbi in a closed session is rather clairvoyant. I quote, the Winnetka Park District is gonna to have to do some things they don't want to do for the whole project or there will be no project. What we are told would be a simple land swap is in fact a complex joint venture that compromises the rights of Winnetka residents who stand to lose control of their own park, views of and access to the beach and be required to shoulder the financial burden of these design choices in perpetuity. The park district, park district is working on a new plan, and while the louvers and metal walls will be removed, planter pockets remain. And I will skip this paragraph, but thank you all for quote, taking planter pockets to me are the Trojan horse for Walden beaches. They've all explained it. I'd love to read these really well-written <laughs> things, but I won't. So just trust me, I'm in total alignment. The Trojan horse can't have it. All righty. Next, last one, doing harm. In my opinion, the actions of the Park District are doing significant harm to the very concept of village governance and to the sanctity of our beaches and parks. The manner in which the Park District leadership has handled this entire process is shocking and unethical. They've been making side deals from the start and continue to do so. In point of fact, the entire board has voted only on one agreement, yet the draft master agreement seems to guide their every move. They continue to create a false sense of urgency to move forward name quickly in the name of progress. And I know you want to talk about progress, Nick. So to me, the entire ordeal represents a major step backward, backward, not forward, for the entire village. We have entered into dangerous waters where private interests supersede the public good, where individual landowners can influence the design of and use of public parks, where our district boards can run rogue operations on the side. Their actions are eroding public confidence in sound board governance. The leadership of the park district has lost its way, in my opinion. At next week's park board meeting, I fully expect they will present their plan, and my bet is they've already talked to many of you of it. Um, I urge you not to endorse it. The process and the veiled attempts to wall on the beach are despicable in addition to the specific design elements. As guardians of all that Winnetka residents hold to be sacred in our village, I hope you will see that endorsing such a plan that includes unprecedented design elements that will lead to walling on our beaches are in turn allowing private landowners to build their own privacy walls is wrong. And further, sanctioning a plan that is the pr product of a corrupted process is wrong as well. Thanks for your time. Thank you, thanks Judy. Next please. Going once. I have a visual aid. My name is Katie Stevens, and I try to make my point crystal clear. And um, I look at the Athenian oath, which says, leave things better than you found it. And who's on the plan commission here? Which of you? I, I heard your names, but thank you for coming. I'm thrilled to meet you because uh, a number of us, Chuck Dowding, P.K. Apatoff, and I have worked for probably 20 years with Chris Rince, when he was a trustee with many other people, to stop the stormwater from going into the lake, which Chris, I commend you. I know there's something next week. Uh, we worked for probably, I don't know, seven years on that. We worked on the cherry, uh, the maintenance shed for the village yards was gonna be in the middle of the par three course at that house. 
and we thought that was very unattractive. We worked to get that moved to the things, thanks to Chuck Dowding, who did a civil engineering project that said it could go there, and it looks beautiful, and it's where it should be. Uh, we, we tried to buy 261. We were the ones that recommended buying 261 when it was 3.2 million in 2006. I have worked with this village tirelessly and publicly for the best cause of the village with no financial gain. And I am begging you to listen to me tonight because I'm very emotional of all the things we've worked on. The maintenance shed, the 261, the stormwater, and Chris with Dwyer Park, we worked for, what, five years every Tuesday night to try and save that public land, which you're finally doing. So I commend you, Christopher Ritz, or Chris Ritz. Um, I went kayaking this weekend. I share a beach with six houses, and I went as far as I could possibly go. I went till I was so tired I thought I was going to die. But I could see nothing that looks like what's about to go into the lake. So I wanted to tell you that I went, I can see Gilson Park all the way from my house, and I can see all the way to Waukegan. I'm not on the lake, I'm one in. The planter pockets that they're proposing, it's a nickname, it's a wall. So don't be fooled. It is worse than the louvers. And where's Chuck? OK. So Chuck, don't leave me. Come up here. The planter pockets are worse than the louvers. We have a gorgeous lake for 26 miles. There are many people that have a drone footage of the 26 miles of lakefront. After the park board buried the louvers, if you go to the 2030 plan, you have to go to the seventh link to page 200 to find the louvers. The documents were not given to their own board, and after giving a presentation to the IDNR, Dick Durbin, Robin Gable, and Ms. Fine, or Mr. Fine, I don't know who it is, none of this information was given to the park board. No attachments to their packets. You all get attachments to your packets. And Warren James is the sole negotiator with a billionaire with a team of like 20 people. And they had to fire a PR, they had to hire a PR firm because they lack such transparency that they recently, uh, allegedly hired a PR firm to help them out. Our, one of our park board commissioners asked uh, Warren James, and it was not Colleen, if Warren worked for Mr. Ishbia. Mr. Ishbia and John Peterson were corresponding this deal, designing walls, calling them planter pockets for one homeowner uh, who wanted to, to set a ridiculous precedent. I believe we spent about $520,000 on this for drawings and the work that we've done thus far with lawyers and other things. But it gets worse. There are strings attached. I thought, silly me, that we owned the park. But no, it gets worse. Apparently, allegedly, there are no dogs, and there's a 75-foot easement on his property northward, and the planter boxes, which I call a wall, is at 500 and the water's at 580. Here's where you come in, Chuck. Ready? Drum roll. The, the, the wall is at 589? 589. 589. So that's nine feet. This is a 10-foot pole. So go to this one down, OK? On top of that, there's allegedly a three-foot planter, but I can't get a straight number from Warren James. So let's do the math. Nine plus three? Twelve. Plus, OK. So I'm going to give you this exhibit, and I'm going to give it to you all. So the trees, uh, uh, I'm going to get into that. Um, so I thought we owned the park, but the planter boxes, the trees are from 50, uh, 7 feet to 50 feet. So every vista that you look at, looking north or south, on both ends, north and south, we'll have a 50-foot tree and 104 trees that I believe we're paying for, but I can't get the straight answer on that either. So there are 100, 104 trees 100 feet into the lake. Yes, you heard it, 100 feet. This is an incredibly selfish deal. He wins, no dogs, an easement, no tables, nothing within 75 feet of him. A 300-foot wall is what the park district can build versus a 125-foot wall, which is what a private homeowner. I thought we owned the park. Oh, and by the way, we're still not sure if we're paying for it. We could be paying for all of this as part of the land swap. And he determines 
So this is the key. What's in the planters in perpetuity. So let's say he puts these trees in and there are seven feet thorny rose bushes that go way out. There are uh, Ketelari junipers that he says are eight feet. They really are 20 feet. And there are a number of those. He gets to decide every year what goes in the planters. So God knows what that will be. Katie, we're going on six minutes. Okay. I think the plan commission should stop the wall um, and that it's, it's not what we want to set as a precedent. We don't know the costs. And I am begging you to make an ordinance to stop this now. I, I believe, I'm going to give you this. This is all the plants. This is, there's nothing like this on the lake. So I, I'm begging you to stop the wall. Thanks, Katie. All right, anybody else? I saw somebody else was getting ready to step up before. Come on up. Hi, um, I'm sorry to take away from your pumpkin time, but uh, I'm Terry Cross, 828 Bell. I just wanted to know if anyone has ever complained about these benches, or do you just not want people to stay long? It's a torture device. I will tell you what. When we redid this, this council chamber in 29, 20, oh, 10, I begged to bring in regular seating. And you know what? The historic component of these seats is evidently way more than I could ever comprehend. And I do believe at some point we're going to talk about actually putting some comfortable seats in this seat because everybody here is our guests, and they deserve to be comfortable, and they deserve to not feel like they're being tortured while they wait to share their opinions with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> we want you to stay all night if you want to. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. And I want to thank you all for participating this evening. And now we're going to move on with uh, our soup du jour, which is uh, the review of the comprehensive plan visioning work prepared by the Plan Commission. Tonight, the Plan Commission, representatives from the Lakota Group and Village staff will be presenting the mission statements, goals, and initiatives regarding the comprehensive plan. The Council will be providing input and guidance that aligns with our vision for the community. And our Community Development Director, David Schoen, is here to kick things off. Uh, good evening, uh, President Rintz, uh, village trustees, and plan commission members. Uh, as President Rintz indicated, uh, this evening we'll be presenting what the plan commission has heard the community call for in terms of the future vision uh, for the community and a framework to achieve that vision. To refresh your memories, uh, we are in phase two of three phases to prepare an updated comprehensive plan. Uh, phase one was the analyze phase during which the Lakota group uh, gathered data and information on the community as well as, well as gathered input put from community members regarding what they would like the village to be in the future. The culmination of that work was summarized in the existing conditions report that was presented to the village council in December of last year. This evening, Acting Chair Golan will talk about the steps the commission took to prepare the vision uh, that we will present this evening. <clears throat> Following his comments, uh, Scott Freres and his team from the Lakota Group will provide a summary of the commission's vision and that uh, summary of that framework. Uh, Scott will also then talk about how we'll take this vision and framework and work with the, comp comp the plan commission um, to turn this information into the comprehensive plan document for the council's consideration, which is our phase three of the project. With that, I'll turn it over uh, to Acting Chair Golan. President Rents and uh, Village Council members, I'm happy to present on behalf of the Plan Commission what we have heard from the community should be the future vision for the village the goals to help us create that vision, and the initiatives that could be taken to achieve those goals. Between the end of January and early June of this year, the Commission met seven times over 20 hours 
to develop with the assistance of the Lakota Group and Village staff the overall vision for the community and the framework we believe will achieve that vision. It's been a labor of love on the part of the plan commissioners and a lot of labor by the Lakota Group. We've learned a lot about the process from them and they've learned about a lot of the village vision through us. What we present to you this evening is based on community input received on numerous different ways. This includes the community input that the consultant team gathered prior to and during the pandemic that was summarized in the existing conditions report which the council reviewed this past December. The document we present this evening is also based upon community input we received directly over the last six months. And lastly, this visioning document includes community input in the form of what each plan commission member brings as residents of the community and what we hear from residents, business owners in the community uh, who are our family, friends, and neighbors. In summary, what I'm trying to say is that this is not the plan commission's vision for the community's future, but the community's vision, and we're excited to share it with you. The next phase in the process is for the commission work is for the commission to work with Lakota group and staff to draft a plan document for the council's consideration. Before we start to work on the plan document tonight, we would like to hear from you if the vision we have identified for the community and the framework to get there is consistent with what you are hearing from the community. We're looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your ideas. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Scott Ferreras and the Lakota group um, to summarize our recommended vision for the village. Scott. Thank you. Uh, kind of on, there we go, we're on, okay. Scott Ferris with the Lakota Group. Uh, thank you all for taking the time tonight during a nice summer evening. Um, appreciate it. We have, um, as John mentioned, we've been working over really the last six months with the Plan Commission. Um, labor of love is one term. I'd say labor is a, com a, a critical component of that, but really a labor of time and effort to think forward understand our community and think through the narrative that spells out the initiatives that we want to move forward with as a community. There is no right and wrong to what you've been presented. There is merely a framework for the discussion to move it forward into what was our next phase of the process. I'm going to uh, move uh, forward through this um, relatively quickly. I'm not going to dive into or read all of the initiatives. I think you have all that information in front of you, but I'll hit some of the highlights of it. But what's really important is understanding what a comprehensive plan is, and we've constantly reiterated that with our uh, uh, plan commission members, always making sure what are we trying to say here, what are we trying to use this for, what is this document all about? And that's the most important thing. It is a comprehensive plan. It has a 20-year life to it. And while we can sit today and understand what's happening to Winneka today, we have to have some forethought looking forward of where we want to go under our control, but we also know that the world changes around us. Uh, and we've had the good fortune uh, to go through a pandemic. And now many people would say that was a bad fortune. In our community, it was a good fortune because it let us stop, hit the reset button, and watch change occur in our community at a very rapid pace. Over the last two years, a lot of new things happened in this community. When we started this plan uh, process, houses weren't moving so fast. Uh, there wasn't a lot of growth in the community. There were all these nice, wonderful restaurants, beautiful streetscapes. Look what's happened in the last two years, the dynamic. Every day I'm amazed at all the young families in strollers that are walking up and down the streets. That wasn't here five years ago. And it shows you that change occurs relatively quickly. Now, there's the good and bad, as we understand tonight. There's a whole new world about safety and security in our community that we need to think about. And perhaps that's part of the ongoing dialogue of building a comprehensive plan. And I say that because a comprehensive plan is a living document. We have to memorize, remember that, that it doesn't just end with what we put together at the end of this year and we adopt. It has to be evaluated and updated regularly by leadership in the community to adapt to the changing times and the current needs of the community. And we've been fortunate to be able to adjust that over that short period of time. We know that this plan is a road work for you as a board to uh, make decisions on to understand the bigger topics, to understand how to reinvest in our community, understand how to move us forward as a community and as a demographic uh, change occurs. The um, front end of this process uh, that you are all familiar with uh, that we used as the basis for this process was our existing conditions report. 
Our existing conditions report is basically the summary of all the information we gather over really a two-year timeline before pandemic, during pandemic, and even currently. It, again, isn't static. It moves and adjusts with time. So as we've gone through this process, we're hearing new things and we're adapting to new things as we go through the process. But this book is the front end of building a comprehensive plan. It's the voice of the community. It speaks to our engagement in the community. It occurred over two years and seven plan commission meetings to get to where we are tonight. That is an amazing feat, I just have to tell you. Normally you don't have seven plan commissions. And we did it a little bit differently in this community. Most of the time we focus on a small steering committee. We brought the whole plan commission together to write the narrative that, that's here tonight. That's a pretty big undertaking and a pretty big responsibility that they worked on diligently. And I can tell you, one of our authors over here, our wordsmiths, Liz Kunkel was the wordsmith, or Liz and Lila, the wordsmiths of changing the, and adapting uh, words. I think that's super important. You don't understand the amount of tweaking that went into all of the initiatives and goals and narrative that are in there, but it's so important to make sure the wording uh, is right, right for our community and right for you to provide the level of understanding and dialogue moving forward. So community engagement is important. Also as important are the key themes that came out of the process. We put those up as a graphic this evening, but the key things were educational excellence. I think we all know that that is the foundation of this community. Authenticity, we're a real town. We're not a manufactured town. What you see outside these doors is the real deal, and we're lucky to have it. We need to protect it, and we need to enhance it. Uh, there are a lot of communities around our country that want this and we have it and that's a, that's a blessing. We have heritage here and the word heritage came up over and over again through our dialogue because it means a lot of things to a lot of different people in different forms. But it speaks to the quality of the sense of place, to the architecture, to the streetscape, to the tree-lined streets, to our beaches, to our uh, public spaces, to our schools, to how we operate as a community uh, from a management standpoint. Important to know that because heritage is a big piece of this conversation. Community of neighborhoods. Community was probably the strongest word that evolved, and building community and strengthening community. That means a lot of things to a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, in a metaphysical way, but also in a physical way. We're building community every day that we spend time on our streetscapes now. We live on the street. We commune on the street. We spend time on the street. On this 4th of July, as we all walked up and down the street, that's our place where we all get together. So community is critical to what we are and to making sure that's a part of this document. And lakefront, as we're talking about. Lakefront, no question about it, we're a lakefront community. And a lot of the uh, discussion with people as we moved it, they thought of it as a beach community, which is really interesting in the conversation. But we are a lakefront community. We are blessed with that lake. That lake means a lot to a lot of different people and to a lot of different things. As a natural resource, it means a lot to us. And so those are the kind of the core, uh, uh, core, I would call it core themes that came out of the process. We know in developing a comprehensive plan, the most important thing is the narrative needs to be simple and clear, graphically rich, short and succinct, and data-driven. We're not the only authors. We have team members that are part of our team. S.B. Friedman are looking at the market and demographic analysis of our community. We have Sam Schwartz looking at what I would call the transit traffic and all the modal splits of how we move about walking, driving, riding bikes, including parking, big topic in the community that we need to think about. So that's all built into the conversation along with our team, Becky, Siraj, and Andy. Uh, we've been actively involved in this from the beginning. Our heart is into it. And I think uh, we've had a, a, a really good uh, run at phase two, which is just halfway through the process. And I want everybody to know that phase two defines the key themes. We've defined pillars. And pillars are the key themes or, or benchmarks of what this community operates off of. And each pillar has its own set of goals and own set of initiatives. The initiatives are the, and goals are the action items. They're the things that we want to move forward with. They're the things that the boards and the commissions are going to be using as the guides to move specific projects and initiatives forward as we move through this um, process. At the end of our comprehensive plan, we project the idea of a matrix, a working document, so critical because it's going to define priorities, action items, budgeting, responsible parties, where we find funding sources, and how we move these things forward in those timelines of one, three, five, ten, and 20 years. We know there's lots of things changing. We might move those. 
Some people uh, looked at the topics as we got into the infrastructure. And as we got into the infrastructure section, that pillar, it was very focused on specific projects because we are a community driven by our own infrastructure systems. We operate and manage our own. And we do a heck of a job at it. But as we looked at it, we needed to pull back from it a little bit and be a little bit more generalized and less specific because as our own commission got into it, they're like, these are a lot of capital improvement projects we don't really necessarily understand. Let's break that down a little bit. That was the, the level of dialogue and, and camaraderie that we had going through this process. Let me take you to the kind of fundamental statement uh, in developing a, a comprehensive plan. The Futures 2040 plan has a mission statement and it's focused on Winneka, the beautiful land, a treasured North Shore Lakefront village with easy access to Chicago, a community that's rich and, uh, and committed to stewardship of all its natural resources, built environment, and its family, family heritage. That was the driver to everything, right? That family friendly heritage, vibrant, walkable communities, active, engaged multi-generational citizenry, housing options for all ages of one's life, and pedestrian friendly. Pedestrian friendly came up as one of the key themes in this building of community. We're a community that you can walk just about anywhere in 15 minutes. That's an amazing aspect. And as John, remember when we talked uh, in our community engagement, we had a conversation with you, you said, hey, it's interesting. We're bordered on only three sides from an access standpoint. We got the lake on the other side. We have our own little protected world in many respects because we've got that forest preserve on one side and the lake on the other. It's amazing that we have such a, a unique type of community that's accessible and connected. So let's talk a little bit about the comprehensive plan pillars of which there are 10. Uh, you all have all this information. I'm not going to go into a deep dive, reading them all out to you. But the first is quality livable neighborhoods. And it really speaks to the character of our single family neighborhoods, the contextual uh, uh, essence of them, how we protect that, how we build to that, providing that variety of housing types and choices. That's become really a sensitive topic in the community, making sure that we can provide that for a range of our citizens moving forward, young and old. We just saw a mass group of young people coming into this community, but we haven't really thought about the other end of that community, which is the older segment, still looking to stay here, and how do we make that evident for them? That walkable, friendly, uh, bicycle nature of it, compatible uh, land use relationships between our institutions and our neighborhoods, and inviting sustainable uh, community spaces throughout the area. Those are really what drive this, in, uh, this pillar. And as we get into, as uh, John mentioned and, and David mentioned, phase three, we are going to build on all of these topics. This is phase three is where we write the meat of all of these initiatives, where we talk about them, where we illustrate them, where we show how we get to them. So we're hitting kind of the highlights tonight from a standpoint of time uh, in our discussion. Pillar number two, vibrant business districts. Uh, I think everybody understands the goal there, and you can look outside and see how that works. The driving goal behind this is in order to have that, you need to invest in them, you need to manage them, you need to program them. Those are the key topics. And you can see the results and the fruits of those things happening in our business district today. They're being managed, they're being programmed, they're being operated, and people are coming to them. And you are seeing the, the benefit of public-private investment and how that works back and forth. When public dollars go into it, private follows. And we're a class example of that, even in a downturn when really commercial retail spaces have kind of flattened out across much of our country, we're doing great. Uh, and what is that special sauce? What is that special recipe? It's our, it's our community and our heritage and our sense of place that's very special. And, and I look at John, we talked about placemaking. We had a long discussion about what that even meant and trying to make sure that everybody understand what the benefit of that uh, particular word is and how it relates to Winneka. And community heritage and placemaking, that was where we found a place to really speak to what is the special sauce of this community, what makes us special, how we reinvest in that heritage, how we protect that heritage. You know, we had the conversation about historic preservation, where does that fall? And really our conversation focused back on the heritage of the community, not on historic preservation per se, but protecting heritage, protecting architecture, protecting trees, protecting our great public spaces, our private spaces, and making sure we're doing that in a way that's tasteful, respectful of the community that we live within. One of the most important things Becky reminded me, and I just want to bring it up, 
that this plan has to be built on what I would call realistically achievable outcomes. We can't put things in here we can't get to. Uh, we can be aspirational and we can look out 20 years, but we have to make sure that this is a plan that we can actually implement. It's doable within our means and within the context of this community's goals and values. Uh, and that is found in each uh, one of these uh, particular pillars. Sustainability uh, and climate action. Uh, sustainability and climate action, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, and I want to tell you that sustainability and climate action has its own pillar because it speaks to the bigger topic of sustainability and climate action and resiliency of a community and how we approach it as a community, how we partner with other organizations and agencies, how we reflect that in the values of our community and making decisions in our community, but inherent in each of the pillars and each of the initiatives within each of the pillars are sustainable actions and policies inside of each of those. So we have the big overarching pillar, but within each of our other 10 pillars, we have sustainable and climate action action uh, priorities and initiatives that are built into that. And you'll see that as you get more into the details of all these things. But we tried to separate it out so the community can understand the bigger picture of what sustainability and climate action means to this community and the more specific actions in each of the individual uh, pillars. I'm gonna take a one second break because I wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to stop me, ask questions, uh, or before we move on to some of the other pillar uh, discussions. Questions, gang? I keep think going. <laughs> keep moving. Okay, keep moving. I'll keep going. Uh, pillar five, educational excellence. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of the the foundations of Winneka. It establishes the value of who we are. It is why people want to be here. And when we speak to educational excellence, the core thing there is to understand that it speaks to both public and private schooling, education, and all the other institutions that are providing that level. It's not just our District 36 mantra, it's all of those institutions that provide that level of engagement and fostering a culture of education uh, and community dialogue. Important to understand that the dialogue under educational excellence focuses on the synergies and efficiencies of working together with these agencies and dialing in the common themes and topics, of which today we talk about safety and security was a priority number one. We went back and understood how the districts particularly address, and the schools particularly address their own safety and security concerns and how we can be a partner with that and understand the bigger and broader aspects of it. The, again, the most important thing is making sure that we support each other and, and, and maintain that high level of ex educational excellence. Pillar six uh, focuses on healthy, engaging lifestyles. Uh, those occur in many facets throughout this community. Uh, this isn't a, as somebody once said in one of our things, this is about working together with our other agencies and uh, local jurisdictions and organizations about sharing, caring, and working together with our parks, open space systems throughout the community and recreational aspects. This speaks to bike trails, it speaks to walkability. And a tiny initiative in this would be, let's finish off sidewalks where they haven't been finished off so we maintain that walkable community. That's health and wellness speaking to all aspects of our community. It also speaks to arts and culture as, a, uh, as an important component of this. That's where we're talking about engaging lifestyles. It's not just about the recreational aspect of it, but it's pro uh, really providing the broader aspects of lifelong learning, lifelong uh, cultural uh, uh, respect and uh, community involvement. And that's another break. If you want one or I'll just keep going. <laughs> I'm taking a nap. Just I'm taking a nap. <laughs> Well, and, and, going, and, and I'll keep going. And I, again, right back to our plan commission, kudos to them. They had to sit through all these for seven months or six months. There's a lot of dialogue in here, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of conversation at a level we probably won't get into tonight, but I just can't stress enough the amount of time and detail they put into this in, in creating all of these documents. Uh, Pillar 7, Community Infrastructure Services and Technology, speaks to the quality of delivering infrastructure services, water, sewer, stormwater. This is where our stormwater discussion, you're already ahead of it, but we put it in here because it's an ongoing service. It's not a one and done after that we have a ribbon cutting uh, tomorrow. It moves on. We have to constantly reinvest. 
We have to constantly look forward. We have to constantly think about how we best manage our infrastructure systems moving forward. And there's some big, big decisions that are baked into that for the community uh, that have economic impacts to us that we, our forefathers thought about, and now we're picking up the ball and running forward with that as, as we move forward. Mobility and accessibility uh, speak to our roadway systems, they speak to our bicycle uh, connectivity, our trail systems, our Green Bay Trail is a major component of that. Uh, Trustee Dearborn, uh, we had a nice walk out there. That's an unbelievable asset that we have moving through our community that we can tap into. But that speaks to really the ability to really act, take action on some of these things. One of the topics that came up and we had dialogue with the Planning Commission was the Green Bay Road Corridor. We need to think about that. We need to understand the dynamics behind that. What does it mean? How do we integrate multi-modes of transportation, pedestrian, bike, traffic? How do we enhance the quality of it? And then how do we tie that, frankly, to land use character and quality? There's different personalities of the Green Bay Road corridor on the north end and the south end. And we've got to have a, 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 str a strategy behind that. Not inherent in the pillars, but I want to make note of this, is land use, uh, land use policy. In comprehensive plans, you generally see a land use plan. Well, we don't have any more land, but we have a land use plan. But some of it may be changing in the future, and where it's changing is along those Green Bay Road corridors and some of our commercial business districts. That's going to be built into each of these pillars to make sure that we're addressing that. We'll talk about that in just a second when we get into our opportunity sites. Civic engagement. Uh, 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 this is uh, a pillar by itself because it's so critical. Uh, so critical in the past, so critical today, and even more so in the future. We need to have and maintain a platform for communicating effectively, uh, positively, and working together to solve uh, common issues and problems in our community. And we need to do it in a way that we focus on activating and recruiting other members of the community into civic engagement. It's a big topic we had throughout this whole thing is how do we get more people involved? Uh, right down to the commissions, to the caucus, we gotta find a way to get more people involved and we got a whole bunch of young people out there that wanna have a voice in the community. So we need to think about how we get them into that and how we diversify our dialogue and our organizational structures and demographics uh, throughout the community. Oper Pillar 10, operational efficiencies and regional coordination speak to thinking of ourselves in the bigger context of the North Shore community and in the region. How do we work together with other agencies, organizations? How do we tap into funding sources? How do we be a bridge to other organizations? How do we use our resources effectively and how do we manage our resources effectively? Sharing, cost sharing, uh, bigger look at how we operate as an organization, uh, sharing um, effective communication, uh, but also thinking long term about how we operate and we could be more cost effective as an organization moving forward. So that is kind of a catch-all from an, uh, really from a, a business standpoint of the community uh, structure. That will take us to the pillar discussion. Um, before I jump into the uh, opportunity zones, I want to take a little break and see if there's any questions you have or thoughts. It's a lot there. <laughs> are we, are we, can we ask a few questions? Sure, yeah. we can. Just, this, since we're, we've gone through the pillars, now we can talk about the pillars. Yep. Um, this is really, there's a lot of meat in here. This is really a great document. So thank wow. you and the commission. I actually read all the plan commission minutes. <laughs> They're great. They were riveting. Um, <laughs> I could tell, I could tell the work oh, yeah. that went into this. Um, just a few questions here um, and just kind of going through a little bit. Um, so my notes here, if I can read my, I was on page nine of the document just at the beginning. I think the first pillar, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, pillar one? Pillar one. So, and, and um, this had to do with the, the housing and the zoning and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. On page nine, goal six, um, you say consider major revisions, major revisions to multifamily zoning districts, et cetera, Thank you. Um, for buildings with massing scale, roof form, and vertical rhythm consistent with the predominant single family nature. I read that as it's saying that what we have today is not consistent with the residential nature of the housing around, I mean, 
I don't think I don't think that's. I think it's we're finding ourselves in a position of always uh, on our heels, reacting to relationships between single-family neighborhoods and some of this what I would call redevelopment opportunity areas, adjacent commercial areas or commercial or corridor areas along Green Bay Road. And when we speak to the opportunity zones, we're going to speak to really about where these gaps in what the market it wants what we want and what might need to change as part of our regulatory environment that was where that conversation came out of and you're pointing out a good point the wording may be not right right well I right? you know I, I look at um, for instance I always go back to the Walden the, the development right and you know that was obviously in a residential neighborhood at least it backed up to one and it didn't feel like it required major zoning changes. It required some you know, changes to the zoning approvals and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I look at that and that could concern some people about major changes. In that and that's, that's the dialogue we expect from you, is that if there's words that trigger, if there are things that aren't clear, then that's what we need it, to It triggered this way, but yep. that doesn't mean anything. Um, page 11, um, I guess, and, and I'm not, developer so I don't get all this but and we'll get into this with some of the opportunities yeah. but on 2.5 um, encourage multifamily development in and around the commercial districts to serve a diverse range of residents da, 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 da. how do we measure is there a way to measure appropriate density and intensity I mean I'll, I'll give an example let, let, yeah. let's say someday the parking lot which I believe is privately owned the grand I believe the parking lot is privately owned yep let's say that family said you know what it's time to move on we're gonna put up a whatever there major thoroughfare there major traffic already how do we measure these opportunities and what the impact is on a community mm -hmm. like ours that there's already I mean we've been talking about one one and some of the people feel like the density over there is Pretty high at the moment mm -hmm. and so there are limits to these things I would think and so how do we get into the plan that we we don't want to over density the building it, I think what you're it, it it's hard to regulate density it's easy to regulate it by virtue of zoning and your zoning is what caps your ability to max out density in any one of these particular areas. height restrictions parking restrictions there's a whole host of different things the comprehensive plan is trying to speak to not how many units and not trying to speak to density and not trying to speak to intensity, but the need to foster vibrant commercial and livable parts of our community, which our downtown area offers opportunity sites to do that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of them. I, and I agree, with, yeah. I agree with that. I just. And you're just trying to say, is there, is there a, an well, imaginary yeah, cap to how much we can handle? So then, in, you know, there's an infrastructure in this mm -hmm. village. You know, how much density can our infrastructure handle? And I don't know how to measure that. Yeah. I'm just saying, but if we're looking forward, we have to make sure we don't go beyond what our infrastructure, including roads, can right. handle. So I don't know how that gets in, if it does or not, but. Uh, well, I, I think you're asking a great question. I don't know that it's a measurable quantity, but it's dictated by a whole host of factors, one of which is density wants to be near transit. And you have three train stations in your town. Uh, so the infrastructure from a transit standpoint is there. Is the, the question is, is there infrastructure? Each development, each opportunity has to, on its own, provide the answers to the impacts of parking, traffic, utilities, finance, uh, fiscal impact, all those things. I think, I think that's, you're asking a question that we need to answer as we move forward in the. I guess in what I'm asking is, should there be language in there that addresses that issue in terms of development. Well, I think community sensibility starts to play into that whole concept too, and that's something you can't quantify, Sorry. but it certainly is a limiting factor as to yeah. what you can and can't do in any given community, including ours. I mean, some of it is subjective and some of it is objective, right. including just limits on infrastructure. Okay. That but we have stuff in our existing ordinances, right? Well, I don't. I, you have controls that are going to There's limit. There's bulk regulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we're trying to get to a more qualitative place with a lot of those conversations, too. I don't think you'll get there because, like, if, let's say the Grand, that whole parking lot thing, 
That's going to come through as a PUD. Right. And no matter where you put it, there's always going to be none in my backyard. Right. right. No so matter where it is, people are used to being a nice, quiet little empty parking lot at night mm -hmm. and some offices. Right. And all of a sudden, if you want four yeah. stories, none of my backyard will That's come true. out. Not only that, John, but you have you have a traffic. I mean, I know there'd be a traffic right. study and right. all that stuff, but I mean, there is just some limitation. All right. Let me just go my, on, on my point here, and then I'll just <laughs> go, go away. Um, on page um, 14, when it talks about, uh, and you might like this one, you may not like it. Actually, I don't think you'll like this. I don't think you'll like this. This is a great document. This is a great document. I'm trying to follow you on my own. <laughs> so I'm on page 14, and yeah. my yeah. question, you probably won't like this, John, but um, on initiative 1.1, Construction. Was there any conversation about considering a residential design review board? There was conversation about that. It was, it, it a, touchy, down the it was a touchy subject. Yes, it is a touchy subject. I, touchy I wonder subject. if in a, in a, you have things in here like consider and discuss. Yes, we went through, we chose wisely how many times we were going to use the right word consider or must or may or whatever because it was a very touchy subject. And I think the Planning Commission did a really good job of managing that messaging enough that says, this is still implying that maybe we do that, but it needs to go to the board to be delved into a little bit further and for us to spend a little bit more time on it. But you know, the topic of having design guidelines, residential, that was really, really it's, touchy. It, I, and I really agree, touchy. I agree, it is, <laughs> I agree it is touchy, but it's, you know, if you talk to people, you know, there's the issue of the demolitions, Mm -hmm. And then there's the issue of what goes up. Right. Are we just the design or the scale? Both. You know what it's you both. I, I, mean, I, I actually, because I'm curious of what the discussion was at the Planning Commission, not to interrupt, yeah. but I'd love to understand, yeah. are there exam recent examples of things that people are like, oh, I don't like the style, I don't like the design, I don't like the windows, or is it more that we think it's too big and out of place? I'm curious, can, you guys talked about it at the Planning Commission. I feel, I feel like it was a pretty general conversation. We weren't identifying specific design elements, but just saying whatever the design elements were in those various areas, there would be an effort to keep those in mind and potentially stay consistent with them, but not to identify or rank them ourselves. Yeah. Uh, right. That was it was not like we want to make sure everyone has Tudor houses. Right. right. No, we no, were no. very no. careful in terms of avoiding anything that felt like a mandate and that we were calling out specific things which is where you get the consider language where you get that softer um, discussion because we want to be able to explore these ideas without saying you know being held to a document that says you must do this in this way by this time and, and there was not only just a mandate to the residents but also a mandate to council that yes. we would have to uphold this document and telling us that we have to have a create this new board seemed inappropriate at that time in this mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. And we're also always trying to keep the permitting process, development process somewhat easy. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, not having design review board, we have a lot of great homes. There, there's a few exceptions here and there probably, <laughs> but there's a lot you know, of versus, too. <laughs> versus some areas where I've worked in, oh, yeah. you know, we went to a town that we personally designed a house on one side of town and the guy decided to build it for himself and not a spec, three miles away. Mm. And we went to the design review board and said, you know, we have a no monotony clause <laughs> in this town. No three miles away. They took a two-story home and basically redesigned a ranch for him. Well, <laughs> so it could get carried away. You're, you're right on that, but there, there are towns that have residential design review boards and that, you know, some are mandated, some are not mandated. I'm just, Again, I'm wondering whether or not that's something that, you know, should be considered, should be maybe outlined a little stronger in this document. Because again, there is a segment of the population here that is very concerned about the demolition of, of nice homes. But then what goes up is also right. a critical element. And that's the wild card if you have a home, you know, next to you that goes down. And, and like, like you know, I and it up, doesn't have to be or the dictatorial, or I mean, it, it can be 
you know, Bob, if it makes you feel any better, we will be talking about this before well, the end of the year. So. <laughs> that does make me feel yeah. better. And, and, and one, um, of the, one of the things I was big on was if you have these houses you're trying to save that are historic, those that work to those historic homes right. have to be more detailed and properly done. Not just, oh, it's historic, let the architect decide what's right. That may require a little more overlook uh, on that project. But we're also then making it harder for them to keep the house. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough move it is, either but way. It, but it's a big issue. But um, um, for the design, is, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't the de design review board currently addressing this or philosophically talking about having a residential? So whether yeah, it's yes. this document or not, I think the conversation's starting yeah. under a different purview than this plan commission's the, if I uh, if I could just uh, as Raj pointed out to me under quality livable neighborhoods on page six, uh, one point five you'll see how we addressed it and I would call it maybe skirting the topic of visual character and it says consider creating a document that provides guidance for the scale and form of new single family residential construction, mm -hmm. okay. which doesn't speak to the design of the facade and the yeah. materials, but it speaks to being context sensitive. It does which is really the bigger issue. Of when you stand back and look at the entire block face, you know, clearly some people just stand out like a sore thumb. Doesn't mean that they did a bad job, just they didn't stand back and look at the bigger picture. You know, we had this conversation about fencing too, like when you look at a street and the one person puts a fence up around their property and everybody else down the whole street doesn't. That's the context sensitive where we could just, if we could instruct people to look at that when they're going through the design process, it might trigger, oh yeah, I mean, we have a design review board that, that, for commercial, that works, I think, pretty darn well. It's a collaborative process. They're, they're not dictatorial. I mean, they, they draw lines in the sand. They do. But yeah, but the problem is, because I sit on a lot of HOA review boards, it can get very, it's very subjective when it comes to people's houses. That's all I'll yeah. say. And it can slow down, yeah. and it can. Yeah. So I think it's one of those things, to your point, we'd have to study it. But I think because you made this reference to almost form-based design reference, I think that gives us that flexibility to look at it in the future. Uh, my, last, my last point is a comment in the, uh, some of the minutes for the Planning Commission. I talked about Pillar 5, that you included education. Becky, I think you talked about that. I thought that was excellent to have in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, uh, it may be. It's really important. Yeah, it is, so I'm glad that that is a pillar. But we wanted to make it clear that it didn't reflect just the public schools, that it reflected all of the school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tomas. Good. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in at this point? Keep it rolling, Scott. Keep rolling. <laughs> what did you say? You guys have heard all this story. I'll about. just give it I'll just give another kudos because I'll follow up on what Bob was saying on the education. I thought, and I hadn't thought about it very quickly, but I thought it was great that you add the civic responsibility among the students. I think we have not just students, but also new members of our community that don't understand our caucus form, you know, and the role of the caucus and all those things. So I thought that was excellent to include as well. We, and we also thought of it as like an incubator for civic engagement. There's, we just really have to work long term on getting people involved. Yep. Uh, and it's hard. It's getting harder all the time. Yeah. Can I just go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make the point that we benefited from input from District 36. In oh, particular, they attended a plan commission meeting, remember, and they talked about an initiative that they have important for District 36 as an example, which is portrait of a graduate. And an important element of that at every age is civic awareness, civic responsibility, and how they fit as citizens in the community. So um, that was a very, I thought, a productive collaboration and an interesting process. Good. Keep going. All right. So opportunity sites. We had a lot of discussion on opportunity sites, uh, very lively discussion. And, uh, and I'll tell you, um, it, it, it stemmed uh, the whole plan. Why do we need to look at these and why are we doing this? Was the original question. Why are we looking at these? Why are these part of the plan? And so I want to just take two steps back. Uh, why we have these in this part of the planning process, this visioning part. 
First of all, this map that you see is a map that was in our um, state of the community report. It reflects what we call opportunity sites, areas of change, susceptible to change, uh, places where development could occur, new businesses, uh, changes in roadway areas, uh, and they occur for the most part along the Green Bay Road corridors we spoke to and in the, in the commercial business districts. What we wanted to show and what this exercise was focused on, and some of these images were shown to the plan commission, to give, again, uh, to Trustee Dearborn's point, to show scale, context, and quality of the style of architecture and, and um, detailing uh, that would be inherent in redevelopment or new development within some of these opportunity sites. So we went through this to kind of give a sense of scale. This, these aren't plans for anything. The second part we said is all of these opportunity site studies are only studies to help communicate an idea and to help us provide the narrative in the comprehensive plan of where we need to make change or how we can improve things to be better in terms of vibrant commercial business districts, quality livable neighborhoods, uh, Im improved uh, accessibility, mobility, what have you. So we took um, a sampling of sites. Um, we initially, in many ways, <laughs> started off with the name of the site, which was not, <laughs> not a happy thing for people. So in this case, this is 746 to 750 Green Bay Road. For those of you who want to know what's more affectionately referred to, it's Havlicek Florist, OK? That was, everybody knows where it is. And everybody, for that matter, knows the fact that there's change occurring on Green Bay Road Corridor. We don't have to really speak to that, but it's occurring, and it'll occur over a time horizon of one, three, five, ten years. Uh, you just, you all just went through the Walden as one of those topics. Uh, uh, and what we wanted to do was show, you know, how development regulatory codes affect the marketplace realities of what occur on these sites. And, are they working effectively, or do we need to change them in order to meet the expectation of the private development world, our adjacent neighbors, and the vision of the community to meet certain needs of housing and quality uh, of life? Uh, so we did these studies. In this particular study, we looked at two different options. One was a very simple two to two and a half story town, and they were done within the confines of the current zoning allowable standards, height, bulk, mass. Uh, impermeable surface, open space, parking, uh, what have you. And in this particular instance, this is a two and a half story townhome development. It shows, uh, to Trustee Dearborn's uh, uh, point, a, a relative density of how much you could put on this site. You know, I'm, if I'm a developer, I'm gonna try and pack it as much as I can, but that wasn't really the exercise, is what can we put on here, and how does that, how is that impacted? Here's another option of a, of a larger building. This is more consistent with what you've all seen recently on Green Bay Road, a corridor, more of a bigger building with parking on a lower level and some surface parking. Again, we're trying to show and meet the parking requirements as they're laid out today. And we wanna challenge some of those expectations, particularly in the business districts where we're close to transit. Do we need to have certain parking requirements that are there? And so we went through this exercise um, with the plan commission to show that there are a range of solutions, none of which are the final plan or that we are supporting, promoting, or developers in for an application, but more as an exercise to show how we think and why we can make changes as we move forward uh, writing the comprehensive plan. You'll see that we show the current zoning requirements, we show these concepts, we show the metrics of how we meet those, but we also show where there's change needed, where there might be some relief needed in any one of these as we go through this that we should think about. And in this particular scenario, one of the topics was height. How do we address height? Height is a big topic, and height can be addressed in a number of different ways, because what we're trying to get at as a community is quality of the building, quality of the architecture, quality of the form, and the relationship to our neighbors that are adjacent to it. And so while we may have a, a height cap of 35 feet, maybe it's okay to go to 40 or 45 because we would rather have a nice peaked roof and not a flat roof. We'd rather have more architectural character. We may need to push the building up slightly higher to get that parking underneath it and provide some green space buffer from the neighbors immediately adjacent to it because we're changing that. So these studies were really focused on where is it incongruent with the what the community wants for, from a value standpoint, and where does that meet the road meet the rubber with the development world and our own mechanisms, and what should we change or not? In many respects, we may not change anything. It's perfectly fine. In others, we may say, you know what? 
we really need to, to lighten up a little bit. As we get to this particular site, it's a great example. Um, this is 966 and 972 Green Bay, affectionately referred to as the Boris uh, Cafe site, and the empty, empty, empty lot next to it. Uh, it is a prime um, uh, example of a little redevelopment site. Uh, it's not a big site, uh, but we know that by virtue of the, of the commercial district, the overlay district, here's what we could do on that site. And so in this example, we were trying to show the layering. And the layering effect is this is a first floor view of this building, showing that commercial, commercial use, showing the front door on the key corner, access across the street from the parking deck and Nino's and everything that's going on over there. And on the back side, we're showing parking. This would be parking, covered parking on the back side off the alley. Remember, we've got to park this because on the second floor, we have residential uses, the second and third floor. Again, trying to stay under the cap of our height allowances in this particular area. And also a setback from our adjacent building to provide light penetration to our neighbors to the south provide light into all the units of this. Again, an illustration, not a development plan, not a final thing. Where the gap in the reality of achieving these nice apartments above this retail space with the parking is, and there's a little example in terms of the scale, the character, the roof forms, addressing the context to the building immediately north of us, which is a three-story building with a beautiful peak roof. There's a Robin's architecture for you, those of you who know it on the first floor of that building. The space is the park. This is everything we want to see from the quality of development, of infill development in our commercial business districts, providing active storefronts, active streetscape, but we can't park it. And so it speaks to, is our parking code really being effective in our commercial business districts? Are we addressing it? Now, the marketplace still needs to have parking for people who are gonna rent a car, but do they need to have 2.2 cars by virtue of bedrooms or the number of units that we have? Or should we be thinking about it on a different scale of where are there shared parking opportunities within a transit supportive environment where there's other public means, like a parking deck across the street? So this is one of those examples where we have a public parking deck. Could we transfer some of those parking requirements to that deck. And we're trying to write about that in the comprehensive plan. We're not trying to solve for this particular site and answer the question. We're trying to talk about shared parking and really rethinking parking. Does parking drive downtown development or does more active uses and providing pathway for good development parking as a secondary topic? Now the private marketplace still needs parking. And if those were condo units, they couldn't sell them without parking. But if they were rental units, they probably could sell them with one space per unit. That's the conversation that we're trying to have in each of these opportunity sites. And again, we did the same study uh, on the south end of the Green Bay Road corridor on what is your uh, land, your controlled land at the um, Indian Hill parking lot. What could we put on there? What's the impact to the parking on the north end? We looked at some rear loaded row home products facing Green Bay Road, understanding the scale, understanding that they would have their own garage parking off of an alley, that we still need to provide the right circulation, dynamics for the parking that's provided by Metra. Uh, we would lose some parking for our relationship with Nutri in order to accomplish some of this, and that would have an impact. How do we, how do we achieve that? In this scheme where we go to a more vertical building, again, a loud, uh, by zoning, again, there's an impact. And the impact would say, well, maybe you have to build a parking deck. And is that something that we would even want to entertain from an economic standpoint? It doesn't necessarily make sense from an economic standpoint as a community. So again, addressing the impacts and then tailoring our comprehensive plan to address those impacts in a, what I would call, a realistically achievable and compelling way uh, that you all can then manage moving forward in discussions with the private marketplace. And a last uh, look uh, was a commercial office on the corner. And this is trying to support an active four corner commercial environment uh, by virtue of uh, the uh, uh, Ta Talia, is it Talia? Is that what the new, uh, Tala. Tala, the new, the new coffee shop going across the street. We've got active, or trying to get some active uh, retail on the opposite side, should we pull development up to that corner and then leave the parking in the back part of it and maybe do a two-story parking here? And what's the impact of parking by virtue of 
of doing that particular area. And again, looking at the looking at the metric the metrics of this, how it works, how it meets, and where it doesn't meet, and then addressing that concern. That's really what these were doing. They were not meant to be, and I want to make sure everybody knows that these weren't studies of what's going to go on that site because we had a lot of discussion from the plan commission, like why are we showing these, or what are you trying to prove, or what are we, and I think uh, we got to a place that we realized they're an educational tool to help us answer questions. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to leave it for another break uh, for all of you, and uh, any questions or thoughts or comments? A lot of stuff went in. I mean, and this is like multiple rounds of changes that we got to these. <laughs> Kim is nodding her head going, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I'll just say I think that I'll exercise on the opportunity site is really, really good, right? Because, I don't know, it's, it's like Sim City, right? You're trying to make choices. And, right. you know, not that anything, but these are potential future things, um, I think it was a good exercise. A lot, of, a lot of comprehensive plans today put those plans in the comprehensive plan to answer the questions for the community, bring clarity to what's anticipated, and take out the unknown variable of what could be there, what could happen. And it doesn't mean that you're approving the plan, it's just saying these are things that could happen there. Um, and so we were trying to do it in a way that was tasteful, but not indicative of a development proposal. Well, and, and I think there, are, except where you indicated, there are by right zoning. Right? Correct. Right. Correct. We started um, with that as the premise, right? Right, because if somebody, you know, like I guess we've seen on Wen Winneka, if somebody wants to do underground parking and um, seek relief on other things, um, it opens up under the PD process to some flexibility. Right. This doesn't, none of these speak to the economics and the fiscal aspects of any one of these particular projects. These are deals, and then these deals come to you and they have to be evaluated on uh, multiple layers of conversation. Uh, to Trustee Dearborn's point, you know, you would do a test what could happen on the Grand Food site. So you knew what the as of right was and what the market expectations were, and that would answer your question in your mind right now. This is the density that could be on that site. And then you'd work backwards from that into how you want to control that. And, and, and that was an exercise you mm. did, the community yeah. did with the downtown yeah. plan, with the Grand Food site and other sites as part of the downtown plan. I remember seeing a plan for the Grand Food sites at some point in time, but I can't remember who did it or where it was, but it was in this room. It's and the we, downtown yeah, plan as part of the downtown plan. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. And so I haven't looked we at didn't look at it this time because the downtown plan considered that. So we tried to identify some different sites. Um, I, the McDonald's site was another one in the downtown plan. Um, the post office site we looked at as part of that and many other exercises we looked at the post office site. Um, so we were just trying to use some different sites to go through the exercise that Scott described. Uh, and I do want you to know that we have reached out to all of the property owners to let them know that we're going through this exercise and the point of the exercise. We've, we've shared the documents with them and I haven't heard back from any of them. Um, and they, they were um, appreciative and as we explained, um, the goal of a comprehensive plan is to start thinking what if. That doesn't mean have a check floors, have, you know, we're not looking for them to close. We're just like, you know, maybe when you're done uh, with the floor shop, it's a non-conforming use um, in a multifamily district that, you know, these are some ideas. Um, there's also an office building um, associated with that property, mm -hmm. and that's owned by uh, the Candelas family. Um, we spoke with them too. So I, I just wanted you to know that we did also speak with the property owners. Yeah, and I suppose if you show those in the comprehensive plan, there's got to be a caveat that it's yeah. not meant uh, they ask, you know, People get worried about approved. that. <laughs> right. Because even as you share with them now, you know, it should be very clear that it may or may not even fly the way it's even shown. Well, that, that's an excellent point that we're not and you're not 
uh, condoning or agreeing to any plan that's in there. And, th and they will bring it back to you and say, look, you put it in your comprehensive plan, therefore I can do this. I would do that. And you, oh, yeah. Right. And so we've got to be very careful. That's why I keep saying it's an exercise to get us to answer your questions. Those may never make it. Those visions may never make it into the final plan unless you feel they're important to communicate the goals inherent. Pictures do the same thing. So what do you want from us, Scott? <laughs> I want you to study the, I really do want your input on the goals and initiatives as trustee. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like born. Dearborn. I'm Dearborn. Um, <laughs> as, you as you brought out, you looked at words. And the words are really important. And if there are words or there are topics that are missing that we need to spend the time on or reevaluate, your look should come back to the plan commission to address as we move forward. Uh, we have, uh, um, and I put up on the, on the screen, a community open house plan for September. They have the 15th and the 22nd are the two dates right now, 15th and the 22nd. Uh, we want to share these pillars with the community. We want to share these goals and share these initiatives. If there are things that we should not be sharing yet or that have need more vetting, and we need to know that from you so that the plan commission, we can work with them to get ready for the open house. And that'll be our way of sharing with the community kind of the fundamental principles of what this report are going to be. Then we're going to be writing and developing the guts of this thing, putting the priorities, the matrix, all those components together over the next couple of months. Okay. Well, can I throw at you the things that popped out at me? Mm -hmm. And, and I'll just flip through here because I did mark a few things. Mm -hmm. Uh, pillar one, goal two, 2.4. I'm trying to understand whether you're recommending creating a cluster cottage housing or if that's just being used as an example. As an example. Okay, mm -hmm. I was a little confused with that and I know mm -hmm. it's something that we've never talked about before. Uh, not to say that it wouldn't be a good idea and actually I've talk to a developer who's been thinking about such a thing. But uh, so the idea is just to think of think differently about how our zoning works. Correct. Okay. Uh, I've got goal six. Uh, pillar two, goal three. I guess this is more of a personal thing than it is a, a village thing. But I think the more we, it bothers me to talk about the Tudor ecstatic <laughs> in, in general, because sure. it's, it's been an albatross and a sacred cow at the same time. And I'm not saying that, that uh, we shouldn't abandon our heritage, because this was a German community, and I, I get all that. But at the same time, there is so much good going out there, on and out there in the architectural community that to shut things down and just say, oh, we're going to stay, the Tudor aesthetic is the anchor for everything that happens in this town, and you've got to use that as your baseline to, to spring from. A good example was one when that got, a lot of people really got their undies in a bunch about, about a, a Beaux-Arts building. Uh, and I'm not making any, any comments one way or another, but I think the important thing, rather than defining style, is just to define excellent architecture and what constitutes excellent architecture. And let the people who are really, really good at this stuff come in and interpret our community and, and then bring it to us. Uh, I think when you anchor it with that, the problem is I'm, and again, that's a personal thing, mm -hmm. I'm trying to stomp out this, this predisposition that everything that is done in Winnetka has to be Tudor. And we even saw it in the last go around for one Winnetka when we sent them, when we sent them out because of five. All John Talty did was give us a Tudor building and, and, you know, figuring, oh, this is the easy way through. We'll just, you know, slap some plaster and, and battens on this thing and, and everybody will love it. Yeah, it is consistent. But somehow I'd like you to think just about reinforcing Tudor anymore. 
I mean, it's here now, but I, I don't think we want to. So it, I'm not really objecting. I'm just concerned about the fact that we're using tutor as some sort of a standard. Just in 3.1. 3.1. Oh, so complement the existing tutor. I mean, I, right. I'm not actually encouraging additional tutor. It's just yeah. we have it. I don't know a lot of things that go with tutor. That's and, and, but it goes back to your just good architecture. <laughs> when yeah. I was on the design review board, the last edition at Country Day School, which is the only of your pictures here. Yeah. yeah. It's really great. Right. Who would have thought awesome about this right. older looking building right. with this great contemporary new entry. It was awesome. It worked out great. So it's that's what I'm talking about. Jeff. Right. So Instead you're of saying, oh, we need to respect the old building because it's old. Correct. So we should mimic more of the, the old, old building. Right. And sometimes we just have to look to the future and allow new and fresh. Do we want a spaceship in town? Well, you know, I've made the point to a few people that there are several modern structures in this town that fit right in. Right over here, I don't know where, you know, where Foxdale ends and it kind of goes around that curve and there's that building back of the dead end. Yeah. And the other one over on Pine Street, right across from, from uh, the community house. I'm not a big fan of modern architecture, but you look at the context and how they've found the right size, the right bulk, the right mass, and the right articulation to actually make it look like it belongs there, at least from my perspective. Mm. So again, using Tudor as some sort of baseline or referring to it as, as an aesthetic even is a little worrisome to me. I'm not saying you have to pull it out. I'm just saying I'd like you guys to think about it a little bit more and maybe yeah. Because, because people from away will read this document and try to interpret what it is they're going to deliver to us when it comes to development. And the last thing I want is somebody with a, with a bad tutor showing up saying, but it's what you said, mm -hmm. you know? No, we aren't. No, and I think that one of the things, I see why tutor would stand out to you there because it is called out in a way that other forms aren't, but I think it, the way that when we were discussing this, it was coming about was just being more mindful right. of right. anything new that was built fitting into mm -hmm. what is pre-existing. Not necessarily that it's Tudor, just that it's there. And that we happen to have a lot of buildings like that. Right. So, I think it's just a very specific size. That it says it's Tudor, very, yeah. Hard, right. to, hard to compliment without replicating. So mm -hmm. Yeah, pitched roof, you know, steeply pitched roofs and brown boards and white stucco. I mean, it's pretty, it doesn't take much to identify a Tudor building. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's just my personal thought. So you guys take it where you want. Yeah, and, and the 3.1 it referred to is just referring to the 2003 guidelines. Right. Where it kind of, kind of says that. Right. Yeah, so, 2003 was really Tudor oriented. That's the right, problem. Right. right. And you look at the pictures in there. <laughs> all I'm all for changing that part. Yeah. But I just. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I think if we just, just give it the word life. Tudor out, just, it yeah, would just answer just the same out. thing, right? Take yeah. the word Tudor out. Yeah. Just take it out. Right. Well, and, and you guys figure it out. Right? Take the word Tudor out. And if you, if you think Tudor is important, then leave it in. It isn't. It's the existing aesthetic. It's just another descriptor. Yeah. No, the the plan commission had this exact same dialogue. They did not want it to be. To, uh, focused on tutor. Mm -hmm. So I think the word tutor is throwing this off because it's meant to say creativity and context sensitive and not tutor, yeah. but it, the right. word tutor jumps off the page almost. It does. Right. <laughs> Especially to somebody well, as sensitive to it as me. Okay. <laughs> right. And given our history where we've had people on plan commission say we are a tutor town. Right. right? right. You know, in the last five years. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I know, it, it keeps coming back. Yeah. Uh, 4.6, uh, yeah, same, uh, same pillar, yeah, mm -hmm. pillar two. I've seen this come up a couple times in about doing something with the county assessor's office, mm -hmm. and I, I guess we could get smart on it and figure out how to have those conversations. <laughs> well, I, I read that. Couple, couple things on that. Can I yeah. add in? Instead of inadvertently, I said unintentionally. I don't know if you chose inadvertently, but I thought unintentionally was a better use of words. And I was thinking, were you thinking? And I, I mean, I think we could think creatively how to do this. We can't change the county. 
Right. But we can probably adopt ordinances that could make it more painful for that to continue. And I don't know. I, I, was that kind of the that thought was process? The, that was the yeah. inherent goal, yeah. It, again, it, I've, I've noticed it popped up, and, and maybe my successor will be more interested in chasing the county down and doing these things. But I look at it and say, it just looks like a lot of work. It's going to be really difficult, especially in the heavily political world of the Cook County Assessor, to get that sort of stuff done. And I don't want to create unrealistic expectations that we can actually do anything about it. Except, like you say, Tina, maybe there's a way we could approach it with ordinance that... I don't know what would be valid, but and, and just throwing out ideas, but if you could charge a fee, you know, after if it's vacant for two years or something, you know, I don't, I'm sure you can't. But Chris, I mean, I, I mean, we can, that's something we can look into and put into the meat of it. I think the question for us would be, is, it, is, the, is the initiative valid? Should it stay in there? And should it go into that 10-year-plus look? Remember, we got all these priorities. Yeah. Yeah. This is clearly not a high priority. <laughs> so maybe it goes down the line. But all of a sudden, there's changes in the county structure of how things are done. And we have a window of opportunity to jump in and make a change. I you know. Or do we pull it out and like, hey, it's 20 years down the line, let somebody else. There's a lot of stuff in here and there's a lot of actions and you're not gonna get to every one of them, clearly. No, well, but I mean. We wanna set it up in a way. That but I'm starting to understand what our span of control is and mm -hmm. what it isn't and, and that one just felt hard to me. Okay. So, Although, um, you know, Chris, I think one of the things we struggled with is mandate for the mm -hmm, council right. versus and maybe that's something that we should say consider advocating for. It's just something maybe there's going to be a council who decides that's something important and oh, it's in the vote no. plan. They thought and so maybe that's how we change it instead of just yeah. eliminating it. Or people just keep kind of <laughs> <laughs> kicking pushing it off. Yeah. Because understand, plan commissioners and that I think us on village council look at this as a to do list. Well and that's and that's right? what we were but we were very careful <laughs> as we went through this to not have it be, you got to do it, and that's where there's, you see the word consider, mm -hmm. and it, you know, just things that we think might be a good idea if that particular council agreed, as opposed to, you know, the, the example I used was burying the, you know, the power lines, you know, yeah. bury all, you know. No, definitely tell us to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the reason it took as long as it did even going through all this is we were trying to war game out all these scenarios <laughs> of when it happens and when the question is going to come up that you may have to deliberate on. Mm -hmm. And so as we were going through these, we were thinking of all those things. And so you may say that's never going to be a, never happen, but some of them you may find that this happens all the time and we don't know how to answer it. And it's just policy driven, not necessarily an action. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can um, I just a question or an idea again? Maybe this is a, something that could be changed by removing the reference to the Cook County Assessor's Office specifically. Aren't we trying to get at policies that unintentionally encourage long-term vacancy, whether right. they're from the Assessor's Office or anybody else? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're assessing commercial vacancy practices that unintentionally encourage long-term vacancies, whatever those are at whatever level. Mm -hmm. At least you're not calling out Cook County. Correct. Right. Yeah, right. well, it's... <laughs> Why would we do that? We are our partner, too. So Why would we do that? But if they're general practices, again, it, it encompasses it. No, and that, it, it that makes perfect there, sense. We just don't have and, to specify it. And again, it's, it, it, it's more thinking through the ability of any village council to really navigate the county right, to that effectuate way. that. Yeah. But we can, we can obviously, in general, keep an eye yeah. on all policies that unintentionally incentivize long-term vacancy, especially at the Forest Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the one. We've been trying to. I know. Uh, all right, moving along though, Pillar 8, initiative goal 1, 1. 1.2. Sorry, did you say 1.2? Oh, I'm sorry, page 28 of 107 in the agenda packet. Um. Uh, it was an interesting thought, team, to uh, think about the feasibility and improvement of the Green Bay Corridor. Uh, 
you know, we've talked to IDOT. I guess I want to make this, bring this down more to the real world of what we've already discovered. We know we've already talked to them. We know the outcome of where that was. Going. They're not going to, they will not be willing participants in conversations about our vision. They don't care at all. Uh, and so, while it's a, it's a great idea, I think maybe we should be a little bit more prescriptive on what process we follow to determine, because I did like the idea when you said this process can t determine the need for a JT. Maybe there's a process in there that makes more sense that doesn't try to get the state to get on board with us because it's not going to happen. So maybe there's another process we can we can engage in as a community or as a region to talk about these things and figure out how we can create a vision and then determine whether we need to do a JT or not. You know, you make because another point you made on in 2.6 was landscaping. Maybe we can landscape Green Bay, the, the Green Bay Road corridor without anybody's permission. I don't know if that's the case because I don't understand all the ownership issues, but then we don't even need IDOT if it's just a beautification of the surrounding areas. So, and I love 2.6 too, so that was a good one. Um, Is, aren't the sidewalks? The sidewalks were interesting because I started to visually try to go from north to south on Green mm -hmm. Bay. Yeah. They're IDOT, right? Yeah, they're IDOT. How do you yeah. planted them? Huh? If it's IDOT's jurisdiction. Is the sidewalk too? Is the, the whole right of way too? Even down south, down by you. Parts of it. Yeah. Parts of it? Yeah. Wow, yeah. you learned something new. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that one was just more amusement than anything, so I, I won't bother you with it. But just bear with me. That was it. Yeah. Is there is there a way though, like for instance on the IDOT thing, I get what you're saying. That right now you're banging your head against the wall, nothing. But in five years, ten years, if there's a change, is there a way we can write this that says if a window opens up with IDOT or we got an edge or we got something they want or whatever? I think you guys are on the right track though, <clears throat> because I really believe that we need to go through a process to kind of get this whole thing moving and if we're going to, if it's going to be part of the change in this community, we should at least have an idea of what the process looks like. So, I mean, maybe some more thought about that. Maybe it's more of community engagement. Maybe it's, you know, all sorts of stuff. But, uh, you know, because I'll be honest, I've always been uh, predisposed to the idea that we just have to do a, a JT, a jurisdictional transfer if we're going to do anything nice on Green Bay. And maybe maybe that isn't the case. Maybe we can do a lot of great stuff and not have to deal with the state of Illinois and make them keep paying for the roadway. Right. <laughs> it's the bottom line. Right. Put a boulevard in. Yeah. Uh, well, then, then we would want a JT. Yeah. <laughs> Be like Glencoe then. Yeah. Uh, that, that's all I had, Scott. Thanks. No, they went through a jurisdictional transfer. Yeah. When it changed, particularly on the north, with the, which I think is kind of nice. Uh -huh. right. it is. Right. It, yeah. You know? yeah. And just so everybody knows, even though this is off topic, but we are we are talking with Kenilworth about a collaborative effort to talk about the Green Bay corridor from their southern border all the way up through Winnetka Avenue, and see if we can do something together that's coordinated and mm -hmm. cool and might also require. Uh, jurisdictional transfer because it's kind of no man's land down that way and it would be a nice a nicer entry into the community too. Mm -hmm. so, Scott, you, I had. you might want to consider some language that would reflect IDOT's shifting policies on JTs yeah. because there's times where they're very <laughs> eager and then there's times where they're recalcitrant and they just won't budge. Okay. So maybe some insight in that regard from your other planners. We can write that as a paragraph to one of these, yeah. Can I ask another question? Is there, again, a similar solution, is there a need to call out IDOT specifically? Can you make it more general to sort of relevant third parties, relevant agencies? Or no, they own the road. I mean, there's no, no I understand, ships going but again, around there. Whoever it is, without calling them out, does it help? Again, it's, again whom, if there's a way around dealing with them, it's whomever we need to deal with. That's what we're talking about. I'd rather call them out. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Then. As would as would our village <laughs> manager. Okay. <laughs> so others jump in. Can, since we're on pillar eight, right? Mm -hmm. Are we still on pillar eight? Yeah. Um, quick question. For three point four, we talk about east or maybe wait, which one? There's east wait east west connections. I my note is why not north south? And this everyone will know is my pet peeve. The there's not an accessible crossing at Tower and Hibbard. Mm -hmm. oh. You have a grade differential and yeah. you have hundreds of kids riding their bikes down to Skokie and Washburn. And you know, because I live in Forest Glen, um, I see it all the time, right? Kids getting off their bikes, kind of struggling. I mean, when I saw the accessible crossings, I thought that might be a good inventory. I know there's utility conflicts. We've got AT&T problems there. I know that that's a long-term solution, but it would seem like making sure some of these pedestrian access points and crossings are accessible, because right now that's one that's not because of the stairs. For Tower and Hibbert, right? Yeah. Tower yeah, but it was also thinking not just east-west connection, but north-south, too. Yeah. Tower, Tower and Hibbert. Tower and Hibbert. Tower. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I know it's a long-term thing. <laughs> no, but you're right. People look confused trying yeah. to cross that intersection. I notice that a lot. Well, because you have to come down if you're on the north side of Tower. And that's a very specific thing, and I know this document needs to be general and broad and flexible, but I think, you know, I maybe think of making sure that the pedestrian crossings are accessible as a long-term goal. Yeah. Thank you. But I think so, so I think in the final document, we may have a map in there where it shows catalytic or key projects for crossings and safety yeah. concerns in there that identify yeah. where those are. I, that, yeah. So it may not be written as a specific policy, but it could be a map in there that identifies where those improvements should occur. Like that whole sidewalk all the way to the porch is where Frank's is a disaster. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And on Willow. Well, well and Hibbert and Willow is another area too. Thing, I mean, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One other con related, sorry, re responding uh, to uh, Trustee Dahlman. We talked about this in the plan commission. There was obviously an intent to have a specific reference to the east west corridors, but it also occurs to me looking at it that one of my issues with it previously that I hadn't sort of put together for myself is that the north-south emphasis is also only on the Green Bay Trail, as opposed to other important corridors like Sheridan or Hibbard right. or Forest Way. And so it's all of that connectivity and making sure the intersections are safe and it's all connected. And so I think that's an important part of it. So it's not just east, it, it's important to focus on east-west, hmm. but other north-south connections too, and not just focus on the Green Bay Trail, which is emphasized in this mm -hmm. document. Mm -hmm. Then I had just a, a couple of typos, <laughs> yes. yeah. so I can give can those to you later. <laughs> that was all. No, we lost yeah. our fear. Taking a break. <laughs> I guess one of the questions we would have is, have we left anything out? <laughs> I mean, you've, I mean, are there, you know, I heard tonight that we haven't really made any mention of the lakeshore. Is that, is, is that something that we ought to consider in our future, in our, in our future work? Are the things that you look at here that you say, gosh, this is really great, but if they, this is something we should address for this to be really great. What I would like clarity on, which maybe tonight's not the spot, but the legal, terminology of I have heard that riparian rights are not in Illinois. I've heard that. Not tonight, but I heard that. And then what rights? I'm sorry. Riparian. Right oh, riparian. Right, 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 riparian. Yeah, yeah. That okay. Illinois doesn't have that or something, which that's the first I heard of that. Oh really? And then Chuck brought up that's part of the land it's a land and trust. Uh public oh, trust doctrine. Public trust doctrine. Right. So how does that pertain to the, the beach and walking across? We probably need more info yeah. on that. So, um, Ben, do you want to address it? I, in, we had the public comment come in late this afternoon, and I think we'll be asking Ben and Peter to weigh in on that comment and give us their legal opinion. Okay. Ben, you want to add anything more, or is there any more to add? I mean, I'll just add, you know, while we're 
waiting for Governor Rents to come back just a couple of real oh, quick. We things. can wait if you want. I mean, I can. I, we a, probably a couple of real quick things. Is the high <laughs> water mark is really, you know, the line. So if you are walking with your feet in the water, for example, when the waves are crashing over your feet, you can legally, you're fine, and you can walk across that. But it, but depending in different states or different rules in different places of where that line is. Um, the other right that in some states would have is access where you can walk across somebody probably to get to mm -hmm. the water, which in Illinois, you can't just walk across somebody's private property down to the beach. Okay. There's access points and so forth. So, you know, th there are some nuances under Illinois law that may be slightly different in other states. Right. Um, and the last thing is, I mean, the public trust doctrine is pretty complicated, um, and there's a lot there, but the idea is there are rules about things that we can do from parking and, and so forth in our own parking lots and so forth, but we can't bar somebody from going to a public beach and say, well, you li happen to live in Rockford and you can't c come into Winneka and use a Winneka beach. Right. And so the big thing with the public trust doctrine is we, we have to open that up when it's public to anybody from any community. Um, mm -hmm. Different than a parking issue and how we pr and do deal with that. Yeah. So, so the part walking in the splashing water, are you allowed to build a wall so you can't cross the, and walk along the water? How, that, that's the question. That's the $64,000 yeah, question. Out. <laughs> Was there a time warp when I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's public comment back at 705. <laughs> Welcome to the public meeting. <laughs> Chris, the question, the question yeah. was, is what, what do you all want us to address in addition? One of the public comments was we should have a plan for the lakefront. I'm not sure that that's our purview or if that's a park district's the park purview. For, the park district already has a plan for the lakefront. So that is not something. And I'm not going to lead the village into opposition against the right. park district, and, and I don't see any reason for it. That's, that's their purview, and, they're, and they're, they were elected to steward those assets. And we were elected not to steward those assets. At least that's the position I'm taking, and it's the position I'm going to continue taking until he tells me different. Well, so to, or his buddy Peter. So Chris, I think, and and the only thing we would have jurisdiction over is the street ends, right? Um, for the mm -hmm. portion of the property, and those are used for outfall and you know not really usable space, right? Right. right. You know, tower access property that we own on either side of tower down yeah. to the pier um, is accessible you know but I think the, the lakefront plan addresses some of that yeah. and I think the park district would work with us cooperatively in that regard but there are other access points or discharge points that are not safe right. and they were never intended to be uh, places for the public to gather safely to overlook yes but to access is, a, is another responsibility that we've never taken on right so that gets back to the point that to include some reference to lakefront concepts in the comp plan is kind of outside of our jurisdiction. Um, I would think so. And seeing that the park district has spent many thousands of dollars creating a plan for the lakefront yeah. that, that was vetted by the community, that we should accept that for what it is and, right. and just understand that our elected brethren on that side of town have done their job. So would we or not? Would we somewhere in the document say that the, the lakefront and all that is the park district's responsibility? And just to clarify the comprehensive plan, so people don't think it's us leaving it out. When our comprehensive plan says lakefront village. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You, you, it's, it, it's like kind of why are we addressing it? Yeah. Yeah. At least address it that hey, by the way. You are. You are in pillar. You purposely built it into pillar six. Okay. Where you're a partner in the topics like that are related that. to the health and wellness and, and engaging lifestyles of your community. But would you consider us a partner, Chris? You, the community can talk to you about their feelings about it. And you can listen to it. They're the manager of that asset. It doesn't mean you don't have a. This is speaking to the interrelationship, intergovernmental relationships, and partnerships. You need to work together for stormwater solution. Mm -hmm. okay, that's not theirs. That's your purview, but you're working together to make that happen. Right. This is the same exact topic, and that's how we wrote about it because we're not writing a 
comprehensive plan for the park district. We're writing it for the village of Winneka under the auspices of what they control from a jurisdictional standpoint. But built into that is these relationships and partnerships and regionality of the topics. And that was purposely built into these pillars mm -hmm. for that re exactly for that reason. And I think that may have been overlooked, but that was purposely built into that for this exact topic that you can weigh in on it, you can have opinion on it, but somebody else is managing it, you are a partner. Sometimes. That makes sense, am I being, is that, right, sometimes, right. is that be, I'm not right. sure the word partner, you have we're to, not. Yeah, you I'm not sure the word partner is right. You have to say that you're a partner, that's all. I'm not sure partner is the right word. Well, think about this, the well, Green Bay Trail is- I mean, warm water, they're our partner. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. But think about the Green Bay Trail. Yeah, it's multi-jurisdictional, they're a partner of yours. They manage it, you own it. But it also goes through Glencoe and Winneka. Right. It's a bigger topic, and that's what that speaks to because people get their healthy and engaging lifestyles by using that asset. Mm -hmm. It really gets down to intergovernmental cooperation. Yeah. Right? And yeah. you become partners by, by virtue of the intergovernmental agreements. Correct. Right? I mean, maybe we need to put more teeth in it. Maybe that's what John's saying is put more teeth into it, and that, yeah. that we can do. But that's how we framed it, just to make sure we were covering that base. Because you don't manage parks and open spaces, they do, but it's super, super important to your community, your constituents. So it's built into that conversation. So is there any kind of intergovernmental inter agreement with that park, the, the beach land, or no? It's just the park district land and that's it. It's like the well, stormwater, we got in agreements. Is there anything with the beach? Or yeah, there's, there's um, at Tower Beach, the north side of Tower is there's a portion that's owned by the village, right. and there's an old agreement that allows them to use it as beach, but it's still the village of Winneka's. Okay. Right? But they understand that for some reason we would need it. There are no plans, but right. if we need it, we would have that opportunity. That's one example right. that I know of. But like the rest of the beachfront is theirs. Is theirs, and yeah. there's no right. intergovernmental agreement. Right. So without so an intergovernmental agreement, there's not a partnership, right. but we'll work with them, right. ideally, to and as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, we fielded uh, an inquiry from an unidentified resident uh, who seemed to think that we actually owned portions of Elder. Right, right. And we had uh, Peter and Ben take a dig at it, and it turns out, nope, we sold it to them. Yeah. It's theirs. It's a long, yeah, so long, I, long, long I guess long just time. to keep it somewhat clear in the document. <coughs> It is separate entities and ownership. You got to remember your community, all the people are using all these things. They don't think oh, about right. who is. Totally it. agree. There's, there's no like, I'm not, that's, I got to go talk to. Well, if someone's not right, they're going to think it's, it's someone else. value somewhere. add. And that's why the word lakefront comes up in here and it comes up from community because the community values that lakefront on so many different levels. Sure. We're not talking about the management of the lakefront. We're talking about the value to the community as an asset and a metaphysical value generator for why they chose to live here. Because, was, because today was 75 here, it was, it was 85 <laughs> inland, so. Yeah. It is That's a, the benefit of the lakefront community. It's so. a very special asset to have, For sure. and it's sure. very difficult to manage <coughs> the, in today's changing climate as well. Any more dig in, guys? No? I, this is an amazing thing. I would, would like to open it up. We. Good public comment yet on this, right? Well, oh, I mean, I, I don't think I have a choice. It's, <laughs> it's an open meeting. Okay, uh, I'll open this up for, for public comment. Again, it's late, and uh, I'm going to ask anybody who speaks during this period to be as responsible as possible and uh, stick to the point. So would anybody like to speak on this this evening? Come on up, Chuck. Yes, we have it. Uh, Chuck Dowding, 968 Elm Street. Uh, thank you very much for letting me uh, have a few uh, moments to share with you some opinions I had after reviewing the document. I think it's a great job. I think folks have been working really hard, and it's, I'm ecstatic that there's an environmental pillar. So <laughs> to begin with, I think that there probably are many comprehensive plans that have one in the, in the whole country. So I think they're kind of a, you know, a, a 
thought leader here in this, in this process, and I'm very thankful for that. So I had, I had three things that I was hopeful that we might be able to uh, change or, or think about or consider to change. And that was, the first one is on Pillar 7, the Community Infrastructure Services and Technology. Um, and under Goal 5, where it is the village will continue to operate and maintain a cost-effective, efficient, and reliable electrical distribution system. And I was hoping we could add sustainable to that. And that was, excuse me? Uh, goal 5, it's right at the top, right at the top of that. I'm lost. Page Number 26. Seven. Well, I, yeah, I didn't it was close. No. Yep. Goal 5, it's the top of the... Gotcha. Goal 5 in the middle of page 26? Yes. The, the, the reason why I'm, I'm coming to this is, as you, you know, you uh, adopted the Metropolitan Mayor's uh, Caucus Climate Action Plan, and the, the most important... Uh, contributor to uh, the greenhouse gases is central plant power. And um, I think that the initiative under that, initiative number one under the five, identifies what the issues are really going to be going forward here in, between now and 2035, having to do with the, uh, our peaking power plant and then also Prairie State. And those, those things are going to happen. And there's, uh, I don't even need to say anything because that's, that's going to happen because of the natural need for um, maintenance of the peaking power plant and then also the fact that Prairie State will have to close down in 2035 to 2038. So that these things are going to happen. But, but I, I think that what I'm hopeful is, is that while we entertain the various possible scenarios and approaches to how this is going to happen between now and 2035 that we think about sustainability. That's why I'm asking that that be added to the goal five. Okay. Yes. Is that part of the definition of the pillar, if you will? Um, I mean, the pillar is kind of general, basically provide reliable power to the to the residents. If you add sustainable there, what what exactly are we saying there? <laughs> that, does that potentially conflict, potentially, with providing reliable power, cost-efficient power? I mean, should it be one of the provisions below it? as opposed to in the main uh, heading of pillar, of the pillar? I mean, I don't know exactly what all the implications, Liz, you might have comments on that. I, I, don't, I just don't know if that changes what they're saying here. What they seem to be saying is. So you're, you're saying that you're worried that sustainable might not be efficient? Is that, is that I'm, what I'm I'm not saying, saying well, I don't I'm know. Just, all I'm saying is what that seems to be saying is that the residents are expecting to receive cost-effective, efficient, and reliable electric service. That's what they're saying. If we add sustainable, does that potentially raise some issues that could conflict with that mission? I don't know. I'm curious if the plan commission considered that previously. Well, and just to point out, goal five is on the electrical distribution system, not on the generation. The generation. So I don't know what sustainable distribution would look like? Well, you, in order to distribute it, you need to obtain it from someplace. That's kind of what, I mean, I don't disagree with your objective here. I'm just wondering whether it should be part of the goal definition. And I'll clarify one other thing. It says the village will continue to operate. So by saying that, you're saying that we're doing it sustainably right now? No. So it the first, the village will continue to operate. This is this modification. So as it reads now, the village will continue to operate and maintain a cost-effective, efficient, and reliable mm -hmm. electrical distribution system. And then he wants to add and sustainable. Right. That, that means that we're already doing it sustainably. Well, we'll continue. Well, yeah, because right now we're just saying we will. Con I mean, we're operating and maintaining an electrical distribution system. Well, I, I think our, our our challenge might be is that. Five, ten years ago, what we thought was sustainable is turning out not to be quite as sustainable as we thought it would. I will agree. What I would like to do is, is refer that 
to the people who okay. are working on the document and let you guys fight it out and figure out what the right thing to do there is? And ahead, look at the words, we'll continue. Or maybe add an additional We're not. goal. Initiative. Yeah, an initiative. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Right. a separate goal. I'll let, I think we can trust our plan commission to sort sort through the through the idea and see okay. what they come back with. Why with me? That's, I just wanted to bring it up. Sure. Um, just continuing with the uh, climate action plan, the one of the other two very important areas is is how we consume uh, natural gas, which has to do with home heating. Um, I, I think in terms of new home construction, there's probably no one who wants to build an inefficient home heating system. <laughs> so they're all going to want to have as efficient as they possibly can. I sometimes for for resale purposes, if you can brand your home as a lead home, you then have an advantage. And I'm hopeful that our our town can find ways in which they can assist people to build lead homes in, in Winnetka. And probably the most important thing in terms of the climate action plan is to, is to build one that is energy efficient. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that we, we could, as, as I indicated here, there are three possibilities for doing this um, under, under Pillar 3, which is the community heritage and placemaking. Um, one would be modify initiative 3.1. I guess maybe we should find the right page for that. I, I, sorry, I didn't put the page numbers down. Um, uh, initiative 3.1, which is update commercial uh, design guidelines, and you might say, and new residential design guidelines. In other words, why not update them to induce people, or reward people to, to build energy efficient homes? Um, so that's one, that's one possibility for that, that, does, that um, initiative is talking more about aesthetic guidelines. Okay. Um, well, I, all right, so I'm, I, I okay, think fine. the issue you want to address would be someplace else. All right. Uh, how about the second possibility then? Add 3.3 .3, then. Uh, develop a village code that induces or rewards new construction to follow a national standard for reducing energy consumed in home heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, that's just a suggestion of researching for ways to do that. Um, you, you could, um, for instance, uh, um, 10 years ago, there was a lot of conversation in our commission about trying to um, have, find some way in which the, the village might assist people to build lead homes. In other words, there are certain building code requirements that would be helpful to modify somewhat so it'd be easier to build a lead, um, a lead home. Uh, and then and now, that, or for instance, to have somebody on the village staff who could who could help assist people to build these homes um, and be, be knowledgeable about what it actually requires to build a lead home. Um, we had trouble advancing that idea, so I'm trying to bring that up here in this context of trying to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, uh, failing that, then the other possibility would be to modify <laughs> Initiative 1.4 and Pillar 4, which um, would be implement sustainable practices, and this is within residential neighborhoods. Now, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I was thinking we could add implement sustainable practices for new residential construction and within residential neighborhoods to the extent possible. So that's another possibility. I'm just trying to find simple ways to shoehorn this in without creating a big problem for everybody, sure. Um, but I think it would be helpful for the village to find ways that they could work toward um, assisting and, and achieving their goal of, uh, of cooperating with the Metropolitan Mayor's Climate Action Plan. I mean, I think that it's, it's um, w whether you believe uh, hu humans are responsible Chuck, for it or not. Number three. Okay. Um, number three is. Um, uh, having to do with uh, uh, quality livable neighborhoods, goal number five. Goal five under. Pillar, uh, uh, Pillar one. I'm finally figuring Pillar out one. how to navigate this thing. <laughs> Pillar one. Pillar one, okay. okay sorry. <laughs> that's under, that's, uh, involves the word sustainable private outdoor space. Um, 
know, so, so far to date, the, the village has banned coal tar based driveway sealers, uh, as well as the use of phosphate fertilizer. So in terms of we're already doing this, but I think it might be helpful to add uh, an initiative 5.8, which would be develop policies that reduce the use of chemicals. Reduce the use of um, chemicals. Okay. I have a comment on your pillar three, number C, and where you talk about, you know, reducing residential construction, you know, practices. ASHRAE ninety point one. Oh, that I was. Believe. Those are just some options. I was was looking for ways in which uh, there would be a possibility. Yeah, I, I think the village already adopted the uh, Illinois uh, International Energy Code, which references ASHRAE ninety point one, so it's already part of the building code. Just an FYI. Okay. That's pretty much all throughout the U.S. Um, does, does that induce people to build more energy efficient homes? Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, well, in, then maybe you're already doing that. If, if you go back maybe 15 years when LEED really just came out 15, 18 years ago, LEED was way up here. Building codes were down here for energy. Mm -hmm. The energy code has come so high up yep. that if you're following ASHRAE or, or the International Energy Code, it's, it's the difference to get to the LEED is going to be like transportation, brownfield sites, uh, walkability to transportation, or right, you know, yeah. so the energy side is really covered pretty heavily. As long as, as, long as the energy, energy side is covered there, and that's yeah. the way in which people uh, uh, um, can be rewarded or induced to, to sure. follow that. And, and it could be noted, obviously, yeah. but yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I'll, you, I'll, Chuck. I'll, uh, Thank you, Chuck. I'll leave. Thank you. Watch for the finished product, uh, and we'll see if this comes or not. Anybody else for public comment? Come on up. It's really late. I'm gonna I'm gonna limit you. He he couldn't wait to get off in a soft chair. Well, three. Uh, let's see. I'm Ron White, and I think I'll take three minutes. Uh, brief remarks, because you know when I look at this long-range plan, I see some bad pennies keep coming up, like a uh, uh, public swimming pool. We have a lake. Uh, we don't have a hotel. Uh, we have a, we've had 10 or 15 years of uh, Winnetka One, useless property, and uh, no revenue you know, for our um, uh, you know, community needs, tax, tax revenue. Uh, we have an aging uh, apartment buildings. Uh, some are not all that nice. We also have some really neat older, uh, uh, you know, garden apartments that uh, are, not, are, you know, you know, the designs of Ernst Benkert. Um, very, you know, very compatible with the um, uh, Tudor revival. And uh, it's unfortunate that we see, you know, the presentation this evening, it looks like um, uh, Chicago down in Boys Town. That's not Winnetka. And, uh, I think they've started at it like, like from, from the wrong direction. But um, the, uh, they sh should have started with the traditional uh, comfort of uh, Tudor revival rather than, uh, or, or, or Ernst Benkert's uh, designs, uh, you know, from the 1950s. Uh, a little bit of California uh, crept in there, but it was always compatible with our community. And I think we should keep it that way. But, um, and, uh, but things that the village has voted against, like swimming pools, uh, I think we should, uh, uh, you know, it, it keeps showing up like a bad penny in the uh, Park District's plan. Uh, got a problem there. But, uh, and, and we don't have a woman, uh, 
Winneka Women's Club anymore. Uh, but then things like uh, uh, the venues of you know, private clubs, uh, they're unsuccessful in Chicago, and they'd be unsuccessful up here too. That's why we don't have a women's club anymore. But uh, no, I think I'm just about done with my three minutes. <laughs> Thanks, but, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes we just have to keep reminding our village leaders and fathers that, uh, and, and ladies, that, uh, you know, some things should be left to history. Now, uh, when it comes to all electric vehicles and all electric cooking and things like that, uh, I, uh, I don't think people have done a complete or reasonable study of the requirements of the modern electric community, the charging of, recharging of electric vehicles and the changing out of their batteries. Uh, you know, I'm an old electrical engineer, put man on the moon, but you know, that's not appreciated. But one of the things we learned, in fact, we saw it again just yesterday, uh, driving out Willow Road at a certain time, I looked up there, boy, that looks like a tornado could drop out of that little squall line. And suddenly there was so much rain, there was water from curb to curb. And got to thinking, hey, our community has ground, uh, static ground lines on our utility poles. But yet in many parts of the community, or some parts of the newer parts of this community, they're putting in buried electric lines. And they're not putting lightning rods on the rooftops. And so all of a sudden you get a fine new home, new home, it has a fire and gets burned out. Because they did not specify or have the requirement for a lightning rod. Now, you, we have lightning rods over at our Duke Child's Field, and it was nice to hear the siren that a thunderstorm was coming along. Winneka does a lot of things right. But then again, I think there's some things that Winneka forgets about, and it doesn't get put into the long-range plan. But uh, so anyway, I've over I've I've um, overspent my three minutes. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for sharing, Ron. Appreciate it. Anybody else? <clears throat> uh, I'm Brendan Andrew. I live at Eight Eight. Uh, we just moved here in February, so we're relatively new. Um, I just had one question, kind of coming off of. Uh, Mr. Dowding's comments. I didn't see in the plan where it addressed electric supply at all. You mentioned the distribution, safe That's and reliable distribution. It. Pardon? That's why I mentioned it. Right. And, and, you know, the electric supply from IMEA is, I was looking this up recently because I do, I'm in renewable energy development for my work. Um, if we were a state, IMEA would have the 49th or 50th dirtiest electricity mix. I think everyone knows that. But I think that's a major problem that I see just kind of with our supply. I know we have limited capacity to deal with it because we have contracts with them. But I didn't, I don't know, is it addressed in the plan? I didn't see where it was. Um, so that would be one question. Just could we put a bullet point in there to explore ways to generate or, you know, work with IMEA to generate cleaner electricity for our consumption? Another interesting factoid, and I don't want to go too long because I know it's late. Um, who here has an electric vehicle? I do. Um, it's actually borderline uh, less climate friendly, more carbon intensive to charge an electric vehicle in Winnetka with the electric mix we have than to just drive an internal combustion engine. So um, I have a hybrid Chrysler Pacifica, so charging that up. I always feel guilty about it. Maybe I should just drive on gas because uh, every kilowatt hour that I charge is two tons of 
um, or excuse me, two pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. So if you have a Tesla, 100 kilowatt hours, every time you charge it, that's 200 pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. So just think about that. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't get your name and address. I'm sorry. Brendan Andrew, uh, 889 Willow. Awesome. You'll be hearing from us. <laughs> <laughs> and he will. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Seeing none, I first of all want to thank you guys. I, I, I have been lurking in the background at a lot of your meetings, and just it is amazing to me the amount of work you guys have done. It's been really, really uplifting to see my own neighbors and friends sitting around a table talking about our community the way you guys are doing it. And it's it's really a special, special experience for me. And based on what I'm seeing in this document, if you compare it with, and, and, and again, I have no, I'm, I'm not disparaging our, our 2020 plan, but this one really gives us some concrete guidelines and, and, and maps to follow going forward, which we really didn't have in the other comp plan. It, it was a lot of, you know, the, the last comp plan did a great job of articulating who we are, where we are, and what we are, but didn't really help us think about what would happen in the future. And you know, as you all know, we've been struggling with it for years now. So thank you for putting in the time and effort. It will be worthwhile. Sometimes it, I'm sure it doesn't feel like it when you're at, and I know your guys went past 930 quite a few times. So <laughs> I cut out after that. So. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, it has been a labor of love, but the Lakota group really has been truly outstanding in guiding us. And, and clearly this plan is going to kick the comprehensive plan up about three notches over it over anything we've seen before, but a lot of it has to do with these three lady and gentlemen uh, sitting over there. And this is just another example of why we're so fortunate in this town to have this kind of homegrown talent available who can come in and really hit the ground running in a community that they know. So thank you so much. It really, and. And David. Well, I mean. <laughs> he's our professional whip cracker, so. Uh, <laughs> Becky goes, oh my God. <laughs> All right, David, you're getting ratted out by your own people now. So. <laughs> it must be getting late. Proud, anyway, proud yeah, well, I start getting punchy at 9.30 on the dot, so you can see that's happening yeah, now. Proud of you, David. Good job. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome. And, and I know you put up with a lot from me over the, the, the months, too, just explaining to me what the heck you guys were up to. But uh, I think it's a great process. And I think we're all going to be really proud of the final result once we uh, once we see it back here again. When are you guys bringing it back for real? <laughs> probably towards the end of the year. Probably towards November, December. Towards the end of the year. Nice. That'll be perfect. Yeah. Looking we've forward been, to it. We've, just been, we've spent the time with the planning commission over the last six months. And of course, everything goes through it slowly. I think we'll be able to kind of catch up now and be right to that narrative. Awesome. Chris, will there be, or Scott, will there be a, um, another revision of this document? Because you wanted us to get back to you with any, will there be another review taking into account these comments or not? Yeah, I think what we'll do is we will sit down collectively from what we heard tonight or any additional that you have. We will update it and we'll bring it back to the plan commission. That's our team. And we'll share with what we've heard to date. We also have that open house coming up in September where we might get some additional feedback from the community that may alter or change things. Uh, but we'll share everything back with you and, and make sure we post it properly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank Anybody you. else? That's the, that's music to my ears. All right, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn, please. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you all Thank so you. much. <laughs>